I'm going to cover blockchain today. Uh, what was listed there was when I used to provide the sort of end, the summary of the of the course, right? But I, but I, before I get into blockchain, I do want to sort of give an overview of this field. Now, some of you have taken my uh, into the PH, into the PhD, the PhD boot camp, so you would uh, know what I'm about to say, right? But uh, AIS is uh, somewhat different from accounting, right? Because <coughs> in accounting, you know, you have various um, areas of research, like, you know, and they tend to coin, you know, so financial and managerial, for example, right? Accounting itself is broken into financial and managerial. Then there's auditing and tax, right? Uh, so those are various fields of accounting research. Right. And uh, people who do PhDs are characterized by two things. One is the area of research, you know, so financial accounting, or, you know, a lot of people are financial accounting, right, or AIS, for example, but also the methodology that they use. So if you are in, um, so for example, the most popular, the, the most common type of accounting researcher in the world is someone who studies financial accounting topics using empirical data, meaning they run regressions and so on, on uh, data they get from uh, data field like CompuStat or something like that. All right, so that's the most common kind of accounting, but there's other methodologies like experimental, uh, analytic, which means mathematical theories. Uh, there are some people who focus on, um, you know, field studies where they go out and actually embed themselves in a company and try and understand what's happening there uh, and so on, right? So uh, you're characterized by both those things, the field of research and your, your methodology, right? Because, uh, you know, it's very hard, at least certainly as a PhD student, to go do more than one methodology and to do more than one area, right? I mean, there's just so much to learn. You know, you have to spend years studying how to do regressions, for example, or how to do experiments, or how to do mathematical theory, that you can't really do both. You know, you can't do more than one area. In the old days, people could, but not anymore, right? And similarly, they're so, they tend to be very specialized. So it's not like all financial accounting, you would do, you know, pension accounting, say, or something like that, right? Or intangibles or, you know, something very, very specialized. Because again, the literature is so vast that, you know, that in whatever area you pick, there's hundreds of papers to read. Okay, so th that's accounting research in general. So how about AIS? Uh, and AIS is somewhat similar, all right? It also has different areas of research. For example, auditing, right, is a very big area of research. In other words, applying technology to auditing. And that's an area that uh, Miklos sort of pioneered and is a very strong area, obviously, in uh, Rutgers, right? Uh, but you can also apply it uh, to other things, like technology can also be applied to, um, uh, well, okay, right? Uh, what makes AIs different from accounting is that technology is both an area of research, right? So the application of technology to accounting, be it in auditing or anything else, right? But it's also a methodology, right? Meaning you use technology to do research, Right, so the most obvious example is um, is text recognition. Right, text recognition is a technology. Right, the ability for finding out ways of looking at information on a piece of paper and translating that into digital data. Right, so uh, you know, so that is both a that is a methodology. It's also an area of research. So when you look at this syllabus, let me share my screen. <clears throat> All right, so if you looked at your syllabus here, you will see that, I think later, so next, the very next class, next week's class, all right, uh, is Kevin Moffat, right? And it's called Text Mining Research, right? Because he see, you know, not only is he an expert on the methodology of text mining, but that's what he, you know, that shapes what kind of research that he does. All right, so uh, now there is a large field uh, or lots of people use text mining to do research. And in fact, all right, uh, 
where originally studying this methodology of text mining was something that only an expert could do, someone like a Kevin Moffat, all right, over time, it has become easier to do, meaning it's become easier for people who are not technologists to learn how to do text mining. There's software available and methodologies available out there. And so now people who are not in AIS are doing a lot of text mining. So text mining has migrated from being something that only AIS people did to something that is now done by people who are outside AIS, who consider themselves to be mainstream accountants, all right? And to them, text mining is just a tool, right? While for someone like a Kevin, he might also have done research on how to improve the methodology of text mining, all right? So I just want to point out that that's a distinction. That is something distinctive about AIS, right? That you can study a methodology and that methodology becomes mainstream, right? Meaning that suddenly people who are, you know, you are victims of your own success. You are no longer only having AIS people use that methodology, other people do. So for example, neural networks and artificial intelligence, right? This is something that once upon a time was so complex that only people in AIS uh, would have used it. But now increasingly you see people uh, in, you know, who consider themselves just pure empirical accountants, use it as a tool, all right? And they apply it then to financial accounting problems or whatever it is, all right? Now, this is an interesting dynamic which raises, you know, certain concerns for AIS people, right? Because it, 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 uh, the issue it raises is who are you competing against? Meaning when you are trying to publish papers, who is your competition? Is it only people in AIS or is it also people in the mainstream uh, accounting, the non-AIS people, right? Now, that's a much larger group of people, right? So if you're competing with them, you know, not only do you have more competition, but you also face the issue of what is the source of your competitive advantage? Is it the technology or is it the application, right? So if you're using, say, text mining, right, and you're applying it to 10K, you know, financial statements, all right? You know, <clears throat> is what's important your ability to do text mining <clears throat> or your understanding of 10Ks and all the accounting issues involved there, all right? The way technology works is that it becomes easier and easier to apply. And at some stage, it no longer becomes something that you need to be an expert in. And so then the shift focuses to, I mean, the, the focus of the competition shifts to your knowledge of the field itself. All right. And so if you are a pure AIS person and your expertise is text mining, then you're now competing with somebody who can also do text mining, but who is an expert in pension accounting, let's say, or something like that. Right. So that's something you don't normally see happening in other fields of accounting, right, where the basis of competition changes. And, and it's important to understand that because this raises a broader issue, which has been raised continuously throughout the field of accounting AIS research which is what is the competitive advantage of you as a researcher, right? Okay, you know, because another very important thing to remember about uh, AIS, right, as a methodology is that the tools we use are typically not invented by us. That is true of accounting too, right? You know, the people who do accounting empirical research did not invent regression analysis, right? That was invented by statisticians. Okay, and text mining or XBRL and so on, they were not invented by AIS people either. Okay, it just turned out that in accounting, the people best able to apply technology like a text mining or visualization or, uh, you know, uh, or, um, you know, uh, what, uh, data analytics or something like that were in AIS, right? But as it becomes easier for non AIS people to use that technology, they lose that source of advantage. And another problem is, or not a problem, another aspect of AIS is that the tools are being developed by people outside AIS, right? So look at text mining, right? Text mining is a, is a fundamental problem in computer science, which means that people, you know, at Microsoft and Facebook and, you know, all over the place, you know, spy agencies are coming up with tools to do text mining, right? So, when you are a text mining AIS person, you could ask yourselves, do I take the technology as given and apply it to some accounting problem or do I try and develop the technology 
for a text mining itself, right? And if I do, you know, am I better able to do that than someone at Microsoft or Facebook with billions of dollars of research funding, right? So that's that's what I mean by competitive advantage. You're to, you're to decide what is your area of expertise. I mean, to me, I mean, obviously, the best combination is if you're able to apply technology to accounting in a way that only an accounting specialist can do, right? Meaning, you know, you understand how to marry the technology with the accounting problem, right? Because if you start doing fundamental research in text mining, you know, it's hard to imagine that you would have a comparative advantage over someone at Microsoft in doing that, right? Someone who's an expert at computer science has a hundred people working with them and a billion dollar research fund, right? I mean, that's just really difficult to imagine, right? And this is a problem that arises all the time, right? Okay, in other words, accountants become victims of their own success, okay? On the one hand, they're competing with people who are doing pure accounting for whom the technology tools become easier to apply. And on the other hand, they're competing with people who are outside accounting, who are experts in computer science and technology, right? And who have a profit-driven motive to keep improving that technology, all right? So, for, you know, the same thing applies in, if you're doing artificial intelligence or XBRL or blockchain or whatever, right? So, for example, XBRL, right? Now, later on, you'll see one no here is going to talk to you about XBRL research, right? Here, you know, where is it somewhere here? All right. Uh, here, in the last class, or almost the last class, you have XBRL research by one no, okay? Now, he's an expert on XBRL, all right? And he has written a lot of papers on XBRL because XBRL is the application of XML to accounting, right? And so, obviously, that's an ideal example of the marriage of technology and accounting, right? Because it took a lot of work to figure out how to apply XML to accounting in a way that makes sense to accounting, right? <clears throat> and it required a lot of research into how do you, you know, what to tag and how to tag and, and this and that, right? Okay. Uh, so, you know, but at this now, a lot of non-accountants are using XPRL. They may not even know it. But of course, the data they are getting from Yahoo Finance or Bloomberg or CompuStat and so on are using XPRL, right, to extract information. So they don't really need to know the technology of XPRL, but they can take advantage of the existence of that technology, right? And that is the state at which a technology simply becomes part of the infrastructure, or as Miklos used to say, part of the plumbing, right? In other words, you don't have to think about it because you can just take it for granted, all right? So in other words, not all applications of technology that is used by accountants warrants research by AIS people, right? Or by any accountant, right? So for example, the most widely used technology in all of accounting right now is spreadsheets, okay? But I don't think you're going to find in the last 25 years a research paper called the use of spreadsheets in accounting, right? It is just so taken for granted Okay, that is not something that someone in AIS is going to study, and they're not going to try and develop AI spreadsheet technology. As a matter of fact, spreadsheets were su supposedly invented <coughs> to do accounting uh, practice, right? To do trial balances and budgeting and so on. Because you know, you when in accounting, when you do say a bu budget, if you change one number, all the other numbers change. And someone got tired of doing that by hand and they said, let's invent a, a linked database, a spreadsheet, okay? But even though accountants may have invented it, right? No one is going to do better research at, in, at, a, at improving Excel than someone at Microsoft, right? So it would be kind of silly for someone in AIS to say, I'm going to try and come up with a better spreadsheet today, right? Did you understand the distinction I'm making, all right? Between, you know, the, <clears throat> between trying to use technology in accounting and doing research on technology itself, right? This is a fine balance because at the beginning of any application of technology, there is a role for AIS researchers to look at the underlying technology and try and make it better fit accounting, right? But as I say, they, have, they become victims of their own success. As, they, as, it, as that technology becomes more widely accepted and as vendors start offering that software uh, and so on, there is less opportunity or role for accountants to do research. AIs people do research in using that technology and they have to move on to the next technology. Now, again, the great advantage of AIs 
is that technology is changing so rapidly that there's always something new, right? So like 10, 15 years ago, there was a lot of research on big data. And I think Miklos, yeah, yes, he is a, he has a whole discussion here, I think, yeah, on big data, all right? So there was a lot of research done on that, right? Then they moved on to audit analytics or blockchain, right, or visualization or something like that. So, you know, the AIS research focus, you know, what is sexy in AIS research tends to change much more rapidly than it does in accounting, right? In accounting, you know, you may start, as a specialist in empirical analysis of pension accounting and retire 40 years later, still as an empirical expert, you know, analyst, uh, analyzing pension accounting, right? Because, you know, that, that field is fairly constant, right? And there's always some dot or whistle to uh, examine them. Okay. All right. So I, I just wanted to give you the sort of overview of well, what the kind of research is that you do. All right. So if you look at, let me just go through this very quickly and show you, all right, wh what kind of stuff uh, is being done here. Okay. Uh, so for example, this, this is an interesting, uh, I'm not entirely sure I know what these papers are, right? But for example, Miklos, uh, you know, <laughs> amongst other things, was an expert on, uh, on uh, what, bibliometric, is that right, Miklos? Yes. Yeah, bibliometric, right? Uh, which is studying the how literature itself evolves, right? And the, you know, what's the link to technology? Well, you know, you can. It's much easier if you can use technology to get the data to do that, right? Okay, so <clears throat> that's that's where this is coming from, and and quite a few accounting researchers like Glenn Gray and so on, uh, working with people from Rutgers, have done very important work in this area. All right, and and in particular. Uh, bibliometric analysis is very helpful in accounting because, as I say, accounting research tends to, uh, you know, start, peak, and decline. They move on to the next topic, right? So it's very interesting to see how those patterns evolve. While you see less of that, say, in mainstream accounting research. Okay. <clears throat> then uh, last week, or not, I don't know, I mean, two weeks ago, uh, you saw uh, Alex talk about REA. Uh, method, right? No, I'll be honest, I have never understood REA, all right? But as I understand, <laughs> right? But, you know, I've never, I mean, I fall asleep not even listening to it. But uh, as I understand it, <laughs> REA is an example of where you're trying to improve the underlying technology to better fit accounting. In other words, REA is a, is a way of creating a database that is better suited to, to record accounting data, right? I, I, I think, right? Is that correct, Miklos? I think you should ask them. They had the two classes on REA. Yes, that's true. Let's ask the students. What is your understanding of REA? Tell me what it is. Hmm. You have to say a name because they are shy. I can't see the people. That's the problem. Say, Lulu, what do you think? How do you see the people? Oh, here we go. Lulu, what do you so, think? What is REA? Oh, so I, so from the lecture, I feel REA is some something like a, um, advanced RPA system to get the all the cycles as a integrity to record this accounting data. That's all. Like what, what's RPA? Numbers. Yeah. What's RPA? What? Oh, okay. No, what is it? You said it's advanced RPA. What is RPA? Oh, what is R? Oh, no, not RP. Ah, uh, sorry. I should say it's like a advanced ERP system. No, ERP. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. Mm. Well, again, anyway, I don't know. <laughs> I'll take your <laughs> word for it. But this is not my area of specialty. It's really difficult for me to follow REA, and I've listened to Alex's lecture. And trust me, he's not the best person to teach what REA is either because it is incomprehensible. Anyway, right? So that's REA, right? So there's an example where, you know, act, I mean, ironically, I think REA is one of the purest examples of AI's research, right? Because this is an area which is very specialized to accounting and you have to be an accounting researcher to do this research because, 
you know, if you go to some somebody, in, you know, a database engineer, they may know a lot more about databases, but they don't understand what is required for accounting, right? So the people who are doing RA research, this is one area which I think is sort of guaranteed to say this is AIS research. Nobody would ever question that. Okay. Now this design science, right? Now this is an interesting area, right? <clears throat> Okay, and, and again, I don't know what Alex taught you about it, all right? He tends to speak in a very sort of theoretical sense, uh, but I'm more interested in it in the sort of political sense, all right? You know, and this comes back to what, I don't know if you thought about it before, right? About what is the purpose of research, right? And, uh, you know, we describe it that as positive versus normative, but that's sort of big words. Normative means we want to make the world a better place. Positive means we want to explain the world as it is, okay? And uh, research, when it was first started, was, I suspect, very normative. We want to make the world a better place. We want to come up with better accounting, okay? And that is, of course, what is of interest to accounting practice, to regulators, to the big four, and so on. They want to come up with better accounting tools, right? But in the last 50 years, uh, business research has become very positive, meaning they feel very reluctant to say this is what the world should look like, right? Because they feel that that is like consulting or something, that it's not rigorous, right? That anybody can have an opinion about what the world should look like, and therefore uh, it's not real research, right? That real research is like uh, the hard sciences, right? Where you look back at the world and say, well, you know, you know, this is the consequence of having pensions accounted for using this standard versus that standard. This is what happened in the market as a result of a change in regulation or something like that. So it's describing the world as it is, right, with very little focus on, you know, what is the best way of doing pension accounting, right? Let's put it that way, right? You don't see papers written like that in accounting research anymore, right, which says, you know, I think the best way of accounting for capital leases is to do this, okay? And, and again, uh, so now in technology, right, that is, we are not like that, right? The whole point of technology is that it's new, right? So we want to apply the new technology to improve accounting, to do uh, auditing better, for example, right? Okay, so Miklos's uh, classic paper with the help by 91 says, you know, hey, you know, let's do auditing using technology, right? And let's do it in real time, continuous auditing. Now, that is normative research, okay? And as I said, that's not something that a lot of people in mainstream accounting are comfortable with. They don't like it, right? Because they say, you know, who cares what your opinion is, right? I mean, your opinion is as good as anybody else's, right? So, the AIS people came up with this idea called design science, all right? And that, the argument here is that, you know, developing a new tool if it's the first time you come up with it, is valid research, okay? So the example they give is building a bridge. Let's say you want to build a bridge across the Straits of Gibraltar, right? Now, no one has ever done that because, you know, it's a very, very challenging engineering problem to build a bridge across the Straits of Gibraltar given the length, the strength of the currents, etc. right? And so they say, look, for the engineer who designs that bridge, right, they are creating new knowledge, okay, and so that should be considered research. Now, the person who builds the second bridge using that knowledge, that's, that's not research, right, they're just copying what someone already has done. So, that's the argument that there are some kinds of research, especially in, a, in technology, when you're for the first time applying that technology to accounting, that that is an example of creating new knowledge, and so it should be considered as rigorous research, even if it's framed as you should be doing this rather than this is how it was done. All right? Do, do you understand that? Right? I, I presume that's the point uh, Alex was trying to make right? when he, when he uh, showed that. All right? So th that's what this design science is. Right? And effectively, a lot of research in, uh, that we do at Rutgers is of this sort. All right, this design side, because we, we are trying to come up with better solutions to accounting problems. Okay, so for example, uh, you know, blockchain is a technology that becomes popular, and Miklos and uh, and uh, and 
what's the name? Um, uh, gosh, help me, Miklos. What's the name? Say that Obama. again. Who whose name? Fernhauper. No, the one we wrote the paper with today. That one. Oh, Jundai. Jundai. Yes, yes. So she, uh, Miklos, and Jundai wrote writes a paper on you know this is how we should apply blockchain to uh, audit, right? Audit practice. All right. So there's an example of design science uh, research. Okay, <clears throat> it's a fine line. And sometimes it's hard to convince mainstream accountants that this is rigorous, real research. But at least that's that's why you're taught this by Alex. Okay. Albert Einstein wrote a paper theory of relativity that was normative. Well, that is correct, right? Yes. I mean, so account. You know, <laughs> the, the hard sciences now. I mean, the whole point of hard sciences is to come up with new theories, right? To say, I think this is a better explanation for the world. But again, they're trying to find an explanation. They're not trying to come up with, you know, I mean, hard scientists don't come up with bridges, for example, right? But anyway, the, the, it's a subtle distinction, but that's why that's there, right? Anyway, so today I'm going to talk about blockchain. Uh, none of these papers match that, so forget that. All right. So text mining, I already discussed. This is an example of both a field and a methodology combined. All right. And increasingly, I mean, look at these papers, right? Look at the people who's, who he cites even going back as 2011 and so on, all right? These are, you know, these are not AIS people, right? So these are examples of people who are in, say, finance or accounting, applying, using techno textual analysis as a tool only. So their focus is not on textual analysis. Their focus is on the application of the tool to a mainstream accounting problem, okay? All right, and so again, you know, you know, someone like a Rob Broomfield who's a real big shot in Chicago or someplace, right? I mean, you know, it, it's hard for you to compete with them if your expertise is textual mining, but it is not, uh, you know, the research and conference calls uh, and so on. All right, here's another example of that uh, where Kevin is also an expert is on eye tracking research. All right, uh, you know, where you can. People are doing something and you can measure. It's like a glorified, you know, it's another version of a lie detector, basically, right? Using eye, the pupils of the eye and so on. Now, this is an area where, I mean, look at this. This research that Kevin did, he doesn't mention it here, right? But is it here? Is this his paper? I can't see. Anyway, right? I mean, he did some research on this for immigration and customs enforcement, ICE, right? Which I'm sure most foreign students are well aware of. Uh, what ICE is, okay? Uh, so, I mean, this is an area where there's enormous amount of research being done by techno pure technology companies, right? And so, you know, it, it's hard to imagine that someone in AI is going to come up with new ways of doing it because we don't have the funding and the, and, and the resources to do the kind of deep psychological, psychometric kind of stuff required to do eye tracking you know, come up with better ways of measuring eye tracking or something like that. But perhaps, you know, we can use it in uh, some sort of experiment in accounting, right? Okay, so that, you know, you would want to focus on that, all right? Here is an, what, what this lady, Hilal Etesoy, uh, is doing, is applying AIS to healthcare, right? So this is an actual application of AI, or, you know, what she's doing, I think, is looking at technological, the use of technology in healthcare uh, itself, right? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. Miklos, you want to add to that? Uh, I am a little bit lost, Michael. Can you say it again? W what this lady does, he love in AI, in healthcare. It's difficult to say. I don't know enough. She works on uh, uh, basically applying operation research stuff for hospitals and etc. She's uh, Extremely accomplished in very few years. Oh, yeah, yeah. I got management science. Publications. Yeah. She just got one into management science. Yeah. I mean, this is one of those strange things. She's a professor here. This is the second year, and I've never ever met her right, because of COVID. It's not so, her second year. This <laughs> is her, it's her first year. Oh. Oh, yes. She's, she has Hang been on, here I... since September, and yes, she this... really hasn't been here because we have been in pandemics. I keep forgetting that this is spring and not fall. That's why. Okay. Yeah. And furthermore, uh, furthermore, when she joined, uh, we were all home. 
So we can meet her. No, we were in Toronto. You you met her when she interviewed, and you even asked. No, no, I didn't. I was in Toronto uh, at that time, right? She, she, when she came, we were in some conference somewhere. Anyway, all right. So, uh, by the way, this is exceptional exceptions, not exceptional exceptions. All right. So Hussein, as you, well, I'm, I hope you know, is one of our professors, one of our students, one of you, in other words, uh, 10 years ago. All right. And so what he's doing is applying technology to the governmental area. And this is a big area of research because the governmental reporting in the U.S. is, is horrendously backward. All right. Uh, in, uh, uh, you know, in applying technology. In fact, one of the big problems with this COVID thing uh, has been the fact that, you know, it's just the, the, their computer systems are so obsolete that they've had real difficulty uh, applying them to, you know, testing and, and stuff like that. All right, so that's one area they're doing, right? And this exceptional exceptions is actually one of the most fundamental problems in auditing and technology, right? Which is that once you, you know, auditing used to be done using sampling to reduce the amount of work that auditors had to do because it was all done manually and it was very difficult. But now that many of the, you know, the checking of transactions is done uh, of the entire, of the entire amount of data of the company and using technology, you can end up with enormous quantities of anomalies that an auditor should go check. All right. And I remember, one of our faculty who was a very senior auditor at Siemens, he said, you know, if you have 10,000 exceptions to examine, uh, that's basically like having none, right? Because you just cannot do it. I mean, there's just no way that you have the time to go look at 10,000 exceptions. So the question is, how do you find of that 10,000, you know, 100 or 200, you know, something that you can look at, but which are also the important ones? That's a very difficult question, right? You know, how do you know you know, for all you know, all 10,000 may be important, right? Okay, but how do you find the most important ones? You know, so that's what this exceptional exceptions is. So he'll talk about how we did that. That was his PhD dissertation, right? So that tells you, you know, the kind of, you know, how good uh, the work can be in a dissertation. Okay, all right. Uh, let me just quickly go on. Cybersecurity, all right? <clears throat> okay, you say here, the paper they cite is called Current state and future directions. There's no, oh, it's forthcoming. So it's a, it's a 2021 paper. All right. You know, this is one of those things you should ask questions about, right? Okay. Is this an area that accountants should look at? All right. I mean, I'm in two minds about it. I mean, clearly it's considered very important because then companies whole, you know, whole existence now is online and cybersecurity is a mortal threat to companies. All right. Okay. <clears throat> uh, you know, and the AICPA, the accounting bodies are interested in accounting, accountants getting more money by ex by giving opinions on, on, you know, how good a company's cybersecurity is and so on. But on the other hand, right, I, I once had a speaker come and speak to Rutgers uh, and he was an expert on cybersecurity and he works with the CIA and he was telling us about the immense problem of cybersecurity. You know, how at that time, ISIS and Iran and North Korea and so on. China, Russia are doing cybersecurity, right? Not China. Sorry. I don't want to say that in front of. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to say that right now when Xi Jinping is probably listening. But anyway, all right. Uh, so. Michael, you go to jail. <laughs> no, my stu your students will go to jail. <laughs> no, no, you go to jail. You have a big mouth. They are not saying anything. Yes. Anyway, the, the point is, that cybersecurity is such a pressing problem. And there's companies like McAfee whose specialty is cybersecurity, right? So again, you ask yourselves, you know, what is the comparative advantage of an accountant looking at cybersecurity? I don't know. I mean, you know, a lot of the research that's being done in this field is now purely empirical, right? Meaning the people are looking at what happens to a company's stock price when they issue, you know, when they are cyber hacked or something like that. All right. Is that AIS? Probably not, right? I mean, the people doing it are often not in AIS, right? So, you know, this is an area where you got to think, okay, do, if I really want to go in there, right, what is my expertise? Okay. All right. <clears throat> now let's talk about this behavioral research. What behavioral research is, is doing experiments, right? So as I say, experiments is one of the main areas of accounting research. And a lot of it takes place in auditing, 
So Helen is an expert on using experiments in auditing, right? Now that she's here, she's doing uh, experiments involving technology. No, experiments are always done using technology, but these are actually, the focus is on technology itself, all right? So there's been a vast amount of literature on, on technology in auditing and, and looking at it either in the field, which is the best outcome, or doing it in a, in a control experimental setting. Okay, and so that's what she will talk about there, right? So that's a good area to go into, but you have to be a, you know, it takes years to understand how to do an experiment, right? And the underlying theory of that is psychology, okay? So you have to know a lot about psychology uh, to do that, okay? But you can see there's a vast literature uh, in this area, right? Lots and lots of papers, okay? Uh, I, I don't know what, this, you know, let's skip that, Okay. Um, so more behavioral research, of course, continuous auditing, right? I mean, this is our specialty at Rutgers. You know, Miklos alone has written 100 papers on this topic. All right. So that is a, a, a very, you know, a continuing stream of research. How do we apply technology to auditing? I mean, there was a time uh, when I know Miklos was like a prophet in the wilderness. You know, auditors simply weren't interested. Okay. Today, the big four are spending billions and billions of dollars on applying technology to auditing. So there is no question that they are fully gung-ho on board with this, right? I mean, they're mainly interested in it as a consulting en engagement, but they are applying it to technology, to auditing. There's no question of that, <clears throat> right? And so well, a large area of research uh, that you're probably involved with already is applying various, uh, you know, doing various projects on different types of applications of technology to auditing, okay? <clears throat> All right, and uh, XPRL I already discussed, okay? All right, so uh, let me just, before I proceed to blockchain, any questions on that? Anything we just discussed, any comments, anything like that? No. Hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> you know, when I teach my undergrads, I get no comments whatsoever. All right. Then uh, ask them a question, Mike. Yeah, but I want to say that can't be the case for PhD students, right? This is not a class class, right? This is more like a seminar, meaning a discussion amongst colleagues. Okay, and that's what you should see yourself as, right? Okay, you're not here to impart knowledge to you. It's to engage in a conversation because that's how you learn and that's how you become part of the research community. All right, so you got to become comfortable. Uh, despite cultural barriers and so on, of participating, right? Because, you know, it, it's only, you know, you learn by talking to other people, right? And sharing ideas and bouncing them off each other and so on, right? So please, you know, feel free to jump in, all right? And, and say, you know, express some thoughts uh, as we go along, okay? <clears throat> hi, hi, it's Alexander. I wanted to ask you a question. Sure. Uh, we, we have covered um, extensively uh, but rather briefly, all different areas of accounting and AIS. And could you please touch a little bit on taxation as well? Ah. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious how AIS, or is there a marriage? Can it be a marriage arranged between two yeah. different... Yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned that, right? I mean, there are fields of accounting research. I mean, if you want to know what the fields of accounting research are, right? The best thing to do is go to the American Accounting Association and look at the sections, right? Because if there's enough interest in the area, there's a section for it. So for example, there's the American Taxation Association, right? So taxation is obviously one of the biggest factors in the entire economy, right? And enormous amounts of accounting practice is devoted to taxation, okay? It just so happens that we don't have anybody here who does tax research, right? We have, um, gosh, my name, Jay Solid, right? Jay Solid. He is an expert on tax, but from the legal perspective, not the accounting perspective, right? So he has testified to Congress and so on, but his research is in law journals, right? So we don't have anybody in Rutgers who actually does accounting research, right, in tax, okay? Uh, so that, that's why we, you know, it, it slips our mind sometimes. But yes, there is a vibrant field of tax research. You know, 
and one of the great thing about tax research is that the tax law changes all the time, right? So you're continuously getting new material uh, to study, all right? And uh, there is technology obviously applied to taxation, all right? In fact, some years ago, I was at uh, uh, ENY or Deloitte presentation, and the speaker was the worldwide partner for tax, right? And he was talking about big data because at that time, big data was a big thing, right? And he, he said, he announced, right, that he has told his staff that if every day you don't come up with a problem, right, with a question in tax that can only be answered using big data, I'll file, right? I thought that was absurd. What a ridiculous comment, right? But anyway, right? so th that showed that they were gung-ho into technology, right? So yes, there is research on technology applied to tax, but nobody at Rutgers does, it, right? So I don't know much about, right? So I'm, I'm sorry to say that. Maybe Miklos knows, right? I, I don't know. About tax? No way. Yeah, right. So again, that's one, you know, no, no school can cover everything, right? Okay, most schools don't have AS. We don't have tax, right? We just never had hired anybody who is a tax expert. Right. But, you know, if you go out there and look, I'm sure you will find a lot of research on tax and accounting, right? Because tax is so complicated nowadays that you need to understand it. Okay. Sorry, I can't answer more than that. That's all. I don't know much more than that, right? Other questions, comments? Professor Michael, I have a question too. Um, sure. So we have this course, um, e commerce, taught by Professor Alex, and it's a pretty intensive class, but um, from the current literatures we, um, we reviewed, um, we fail to see how that can be um, connected to our area of research, basically infrastructure and pricing and things like that. Should I be diplomatic in answering that or not? Be right. diplomatic, Michael, if you know how to. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it this way. 25 years ago, right? Uh, Almost nobody in accounting knew anything about the internet. All right. You know, nobody, I mean, literally, no one, not in practice, not in research, no one knew anything. Right. The, the only people who were like sort of the pioneers were Mick Gloss and Alex. Right. So, for example, the AICPA, right, their website was created by Mick Gloss, right, and hosted by Rutgers because they had a clue what was meant by having a website. Right. Uh, and so, you know, that was the early days. Obviously, since then, the internet has, you know, th that's become taken off, right? And similarly, uh, at the early days in the 1990s and all, when e-commerce was just starting, there was a lot of questions about, you know, will, you know, how do you do transactions? Uh, how can people, how, why will people trust, um, you know, transactions when you can't see face to face? And when you can't touch the product and so on, right? And so uh, they actually wrote a book, I think, right, on e-commerce, right? Yes. Uh, at the time, right? So that's when this class was created, right? And and it continues today. Right? Let me just stop there and not make any more statement than that. Miklas, don't you want to say something? What should I say? <laughs> Meaning... <laughs> This has been a very long journey and yes. very slow. And it continues. Hmm. Yeah. All right, other questions? They are going to hear a lot about continuous auditing from me uh, in this class and uh, in the audit class. So okay. I'm not going to... Yeah, no, I mean, that, that, no question. Continuous auditing is part of accounting, right? E-commerce, you know... E-commerce e has a whole angle around the, uh, around the booking and the management and the assurance of the transactions that, are, that is very much in accounting. But uh, the other part of uh, e-commerce, there are marketing angles, statistical angles, whatever. Yeah, I mean, you know, there are some topics that can only be taught in accounting. Right, continuous auditing, for example, right, XPRL. There are other topics that could be taught in another field, like marketing or 
AIS, right? Uh, sorry, um, uh, e-computer science or something, right? Like e-commerce, right? So, you know, clearly there are some that are more closely accounting than others, right? You know, and, and so then that creates the question of where it should be taught and how it should be taught. But, you know, that's just the way it is, right? Okay. Uh, what else was I going to say? I forgot. Uh, oh, but yeah, I just want to, you know, as an accountant or as a researcher, you must always keep a broad view, right? I mean, this is true of any kind of research. Do not fall into the trap. You know, there's a saying, right? If your only tool is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail, right? What that means is don't get so narrow that you fail to see the bigger picture, right? When e-commerce started, there was a lot of discussion about why people would trust, you know, buying something online, right? And all kinds of solutions were put forward, which were implemented, things like seals of approval and, you know, cryptography and, and this and that, right? But do you know why e-commerce became trillion, worth trillions of dollars? Anybody know? Right? It was none of those things. It was because the credit card company said, right, if you are, if something bad happens, you are not responsible. Okay? You, your liability is zero. Right? So if, if you buy something and it, it doesn't turn up, you don't have to pay. Okay? That was the choice they made. It removed risk from the consumer and put it onto the person doing the transaction. Right? And they did it because they realized that whatever cost that that would create to them were trivial compared to the enormous amount of fees they will get from facilitating e-commerce. Okay. So th there's a, that's a non-technology solution that created e-commerce as we know it today. All right. Because if they hadn't said that, we would still be discussing, well, how do we get people to trust, you know, online purchases and so on. Right. Okay. Look at eBay. eBay became enormously successful after PayPal was created. Right. Where PayPal said, we will, you know, if, if you're not happy with your transaction, you don't, we will give you your money back. Okay. All right. So don't think that technology is the only solution. You must see the bigger picture, right? This is why you study economics and so on. So you get a broader perspective than technology alone. Do not think, you know, we are doing accounting. Accounting is a, is a field of professional practice. It's a business field. Right? So do not just get so focused on technology that you fail to see the bigger picture. Right? Okay, we are in applied field. We apply technology to, business, to accounting problems. Right? We are not pure technology. So do not just focus on that alone. Okay? So I, I thought that was an interesting example of that when I look back on that literature uh, you know, from 25 years ago. Okay? All right. So anyway, uh, what I promised today was to discuss uh, blockchain. Right? Now, Whenever I talk about a technology like this, uh, I find it a little bit daunting because I know there's at least some of you, if not all of you, who actually know this topic far better than me. Yeah, right? Don't bet on that. <laughs> right? I don't think so. I'm sure at least some of you know a lot more about blockchain than I will ever know. Okay. Uh, but blockchain is obviously the sexy thing, right? For the last couple of years, right? It is enormously uh, important, right? You hear about it all the time. You, you know that Bitcoin is now 30,000 a coin or some mad thing like that, right? You know, it's like double or triple since COVID began, okay? Uh, and blockchain is used uh, widely in all manner of uh, areas of business, okay? And it will become more and more, right? People are talking that, you know, in the next 10 years, it'll become worth $20 trillion or $15 trillion or some astronomical amount of money, all right? Uh, I think the, the head of the European Central Bank or the Bank of China is introducing or plans to introduce their own cyber currencies uh, and so on, right? So this is an area that we obviously need to understand because uh, if nothing else, the big four accounting firms are extensively selling consulting in blockchain okay you know less so in applying it to accounting but they are certainly experts you know if you go and look at their websites there's enormous amount of uh, glitzy parts of their websites on the blockchain services that they offer 
Okay. So what I want to do today, uh, you know, is, is to give you a sort of introduction to it. Again, I know some of you will find this repetitious, all right, but at least some of you I perhaps do not know uh, blockchain, uh, you know, thoroughly. Okay. So this is a very complex area. Okay. And so there's two aspects to it. One is uh, understanding the technology and then applying it to accounting, right? And the second part is, is you know, the research is growing in that area. Again, some of the pioneers in this were like Nick Loss, right? And you will see a paper that he wrote in 2017. So now it's four years ago now, right? On applying blockchain to uh, auditing, right? And there's been a lot of papers since, right? So you know, this is a hot area of research, right? But first you have to understand what blockchain is, okay? Right? Anybody know where blockchain started? Uh, the reason I ask is, you know, because most innovations in, in technology, you know, they gradually arise, okay? Uh, you know, and lots of people come up with things that coalesce into, you know, text mining, let's say, right? But, and the same is true. The underlying technology for blockchain slowly developed over several decades. But one person, at, at least people think it's one person, actually brought them together and developed the finished form of it, okay? You know, and it is an act of incredible genius, right? I mean, this is one of the smartest people that has ever lived, right? To create, uh, well, they didn't create blockchain. They invented Bitcoin, right? Now, I'm sure you heard of Bitcoin. That's the first cyber currency, okay? And blockchain is the underlying technology of Bitcoin, right? Now, in fact, the word blockchain does not appear in the original Bitcoin paper, right? That's the name other people came up with to explain, to, to understand what the underlying technology is of Bitcoin, okay? But Bitcoin is an incredible achievement, right? It uses advances in cybersecurity and computer science and, and, and economics over many different fields, over many decades, and brought them all together into one finished product, all right, which is an incredible achievement. And it wasn't a theoretical thing. It was, of course, an actual product, meaning Bitcoin was launched by the inventor of Bitcoin, right? And it's still the Bitcoin that we use today, all right? And that fellow's name, as you may or may not know, where is it? Right, is this character. Oh, sorry, I don't think I'm sharing. Let me go back and share my screen again. All right, this character, Satoshi Nakamoto. All right, this is the paper, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. All right, now if this, you know, nobody knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is. It's not a real name, okay? It's someone's name, okay? And like I said, people have tried. If you go on YouTube, there's videos on people trying to discover, governments have tried to discover who this fellow was or whether it's one person or a team of people but nobody has discovered it, right? I mean, if this person, if, if he was a real person, would have won the Nobel Prize in economics. Because this is one of the greatest intellectual achievements in history, all right? Okay, what, what this whole thing called Bitcoin, okay? And the underlying technology of Bitcoin is what's now called blockchain, okay? And blockchain is now applied to things other than Cyber currency. A cyber currency is a digital currency, and I'll explain in a moment uh, what that is. Okay, but it's used in a lot of other things. So let me find it. Hold on. Scores, dozens of enormous projects using blockchain. For example, in shipping, right? It's being used to track containers going across oceans. In supply chains, border control, voting, Endangered Species Act, in art markets and so on, right? In all kinds of places now, people are using blockchain, all right, as a, as a tool, okay? So <clears throat> it's clearly of, of fundamental importance. I mean, this blockchain is orders of magnitude more important than any other technology you're studying in this class, all right? You know, XPRL and so on. I mean, these are specialized things for accounting. Blockchain, it is claimed, will change the entire world. All right. Okay. That in years to come, all right, you know, it will be the post blockchain world. I mean, in other words, you know, everything will be before blockchain and after blockchain. All right. That almost every aspect of our life is going to be changed by this technology. 
Okay, it's that important. And so we need to understand uh, what this blockchain is, right? And to understand what blockchain is, we first have to understand what Bitcoin is, okay? And there's a lot of different moving parts, right? Again, the, the genius of Nakamoto was that he didn't just invent one thing, but he didn't, right? What he did was he took developments from many different areas and figured out how to use them together, to fit them together to create <coughs> this electronic cash system, okay? And the point of Bitcoin is this, right? Bitcoin is used to exchange trans to have exchange transactions, right? Between people who don't trust each other. Right? Let me repeat that. It's for transactions between people who don't trust each other. Okay. Why is that important? Because getting trust is very expensive. All right. Okay. It means you have to get to know someone and believe that if they say, you know, if I give you money, right? They, you will give them the good, right? You know, you, you order, you, you pay someone to fix your car and they will fix the car, right? I mean, that kind of transaction requires trust, okay? And much of the modern world is designed in such a way as to allow that trust, you know, to create transactions with trust, right? So a credit card, all right? The reason a credit card works is because the shop owner trusts that, when a customer scans that card and walks out with all the goods, right, that eventually they will be paid by MasterCard or Visa. All right. If they didn't trust that, that transaction wouldn't take place. Okay. And in order to get that trust, right, in order to take on that role of the trusted person, my Microsoft, I mean, Visa or MasterCard takes three to four percent of the value of the transaction. All right. That's the cost of trust, okay, all right? So a lot of the transactions in the world require trust, all right? And if you don't have trust, you need to ver you need to do as uh, the old saying goes, trust but verify, all right? And that's what accountants do. Accounting is designed for a world without trust, right? So accounting is a way of keeping track of transactions, right? To ensure that if you give money to a company as a shareholder, that company will use your money to give you profits, all right? And they won't steal that profits or run off with the assets of the company and so on, all right? Auditing, right, is used to check whether people are doing accounting properly and so forth, right? So all of this requires trust. But what Nakamoto said was, you know, the world would be a lot better if we didn't have to trust each other. If we had a foolproof system that enabled transactions to take place without trust, all right. And he said, I can do that using technology. Okay. And it was a brilliantly uh, inventive method of doing that. Okay. So what, how do we do this? Right. I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm not the world's best expert on this and I don't need to be because there are tons of videos and so on out there on this topic. Right. And so what I'm going to do now is we are going to spend about half an hour. All right on a video that explains how Bitcoin works. All right. Now, again, you know, you can. What does it mean to have a Bitcoin? Right. Sorry. Let me pause that. You know, you can go off and have a cup of coffee or whatever it is you need to do. Well, what, listen, listen to this. Right. But this is, the, I mean, amongst many other videos out there, you can see there's other videos out there. But I think this goes in depth through the various aspects of Bitcoin. And, and you'll see there are many moving parts. Right. The reason Bitcoin works is because you have you have, you have thought about all the pitfalls, all the areas where things could go wrong and come up with a solution for them, all right? It was a complete package solution that worked, okay? And it works now when the market for Bitcoin is worth, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars, okay? Of course, there have been some modifications and so on, but, the, but what is Bitcoin today is essentially the same as the technology Nakamoto uh, put forward in 2009, and it slowly grew, and then it exploded into, you know, worth billions and billions and billions of dollars now, okay? So please listen. I'm going to play this. You can listen to it, right? And, you know, if there's parts you don't understand, just take a note, and after half an hour, I'll come back and we'll go through it and discuss any uh, questions that you have or anything you're unsure of. Any any questions before we begin? 
No? Okay. All right. So I'm going to put this on full screen. And it's, as you can see, it takes 26 minutes. So I'll come back after 26 minutes and go over it with you. Okay. Many people have heard of Bitcoin, that it's a fully digital currency Sorry, with no... Let me just stop. Can everyone hear and see the video properly? Yep. Okay. ...government to issue it, and that no banks need to manage accounts and verify transactions. And also that no one really knows who invented it. And yet, many people don't know the answer to this question, at least not in full. To get there, There's and no to sound. make sure that the technical details underlying the answer actually feel motivated, what we're going to do is Sorry, I'm not sure what's happening there. Hold on. Many people have heard of Bitcoin, that it's a fully digital currency with no government to issue it, and that no banks need to manage accounts and verify transactions. And also that no one really knows who invented it. And yet, many people don't know the answer to this question, at least not in full. And to make sure that the technical details underlying the answer actually feel motivated, what we're going to do is walk through, step by step, how you might have invented your own version of Bitcoin. We'll start with you keeping track of payments with your friends using a communal ledger. And then, as you start to trust your friends and the world around you less and less, and if you're clever enough to bring in a few ideas from cryptography to help circumvent the need for trust, what you end up with is what's called a cryptocurrency. You see, Bitcoin is just the first implemented example of a cryptocurrency. And now there are thousands more on exchanges with traditional currencies. Walking the path of inventing your own can help to set the foundations for understanding some of the more recent players in the game and recognizing when and why there's room for different design choices. In fact, one of the reasons I chose this topic is that in the last year, there's been a huge amount of attention and investment and, well, honestly, hype directed at these currencies. And I'm not going to comment or speculate on the current or future exchange rates, but I think we'd all agree that anyone looking to buy a cryptocurrency should really know what it is. And I don't just mean in terms of analogies with vague connections to gold mining. I mean an actual direct description of what the computers are doing when we send, receive, and create cryptocurrencies. One thing worth stressing, by the way, is that even though you and I are going to dig into the details here, and that takes meaningful time, you don't actually need to know those details if you just want to use the cryptocurrency. Just like you don't need to know the details of what happens under the hood when you swipe a credit card. Like any digital payment, there's lots of user-friendly applications that let you just send and receive the currencies without thinking about what's going on. The difference is that the backbone underlying this is not a bank that verifies transactions. Instead, it's a clever system of decentralized trustless verification based on some of the math born in cryptography. But to start, I want you to actually set aside the thought of cryptocurrencies and all that just for a few minutes. We're going to begin the story with something more down to earth, ledgers and digital signatures. If you and your friends exchange money pretty frequently, you know, paying your share of the dinner bill and such, it can be inconvenient to exchange cash all the time. So you might keep a communal ledger that records all of the payments that you intend to make some point in the future. You know, Alice pays Bob $20, Bob pays Charlie $40, things like that. This ledger is going to be something public and accessible to everyone, like a website where anyone can go and just add new lines. And let's say that at the end of every month, you all get together, look at the list of transactions, and settle up. If you spent more than you received, you put that money in the pot, and if you received more than you spent, you take that money out. So the protocol for being part of this very simple system might look like this. Anyone can add lines to the ledger, and at the end of every month, you all get together and settle up. Now one problem with a public ledger like this is that anyone can add a line. So what's to prevent Bob from going and writing Alice pays Bob $100 without Alice approving? How are we supposed to trust that all of these transactions are what the sender meant them to be. Well, this is where the first bit of cryptography comes in. Digital signatures. Like handwritten signatures, the idea here is that Alice should be able to add something next to that transaction that proves that she has seen it and that she's approved of it. 
and it should be infeasible for anyone else to forge that signature. At first, it might seem like a digital signature shouldn't even be possible. I mean, whatever data makes up that signature can just be read and copied by a computer, so how do you prevent forgeries? Well, the way this works is that everyone generates what's called a public key private key pair, each of which looks like some string of bits. The private key is sometimes also called a secret key, so that we can abbreviate it as SK while abbreviating the public key as PK. Now, as the name suggests, this secret key, it's something you want to keep to yourself. In the real world, your handwritten signature looks the same no matter what document you're signing. But a digital signature is actually much stronger, because it changes for different messages. It looks like some string of ones and zeros, commonly something like 256 bits, and altering the message even slightly completely changes what the signature on that message should look like. Speaking a little more formally, producing a signature involves a function that depends both on the message itself and on your private key. The private key ensures that only you can produce that signature, and the fact that it depends on the message means that no one can just copy one of your signatures and then forge it on another message. Hand in hand with this is a second function used to verify that a signature is valid. And this is where the public key comes into play. All it does is output true or false to indicate if this was a signature produced by the private key associated with the public key that you're using for verification. I won't go into the details of how exactly both these functions work, but the idea is that it should be completely infeasible to find a valid signature if you don't know the secret key. Specifically, there's no strategy better than just guessing and checking random signatures, which you can check using the public key that everyone knows. Now think about how many signatures there are with a length of 256 bits. That's 2 to the power of 256. This is a stupidly large number. To call it astronomically large would be giving way too much credit to astronomy. In fact, I made a supplemental video devoted just to illustrating what a huge number this is. Right here, let's just say that when you verify that a signature against a given message is valid, you can feel extremely confident that the only way someone could have produced it is if they knew the secret key associated with the public key you used for verification. Now, making sure that people sign transactions on the ledger is pretty good, but there's one slight loophole. If Alice signs a transaction like Alice pays Bob $100, even though Bob can't forge Alice's signature on a new message, he could just copy that same line as many times as he wants. I mean, that message-signature combination remains valid. To get around this, what we do is make it so that when you sign a transaction, the message has to also include some sort of unique ID associated with that transaction. That way, if Alice pays Bob $100 multiple times, each one of those lines on the ledger requires a completely new signature. All right, great. Digital signatures remove a huge aspect of trust in this initial protocol. But even still, if you were to really do this, you would be relying on an honor system of sorts. Namely, you're trusting that everyone will actually follow through and settle up in cash at the end of each month. What if, for example, Charlie racks up thousands of dollars in debt and just refuses to show up? The only real reason to revert back to cash to settle up is if some people, I'm looking at you, Charlie, owe a lot of money. So maybe you have the clever idea that you never actually have to settle up in cash as long as you have some way to prevent people from spending too much more than they take in. Maybe what you do is start by having everyone pay $100 into the pot, and then have the first few lines of the ledger read, Alice gets $100, Bob gets $100, Charlie gets $100, etc. Now, just don't accept any transactions where someone is spending more than they already have on that ledger. For example, if the first two transactions are Charlie pays Alice $50 and Charlie pays Bob $50, if he were to try to add Charlie pays you $20, that would be invalid, as invalid as if he had never signed it. Notice, this means that verifying a transaction requires knowing the full history of transactions up to that point. And this is, more or less, also going to be true in cryptocurrencies, though there is a little room for optimization. What's interesting here is that this step removes the connection between the ledger and actual physical US dollars. 
In theory, if everyone in the world was using this ledger, you could live your whole life just sending and receiving money on this ledger without ever having to convert to real US dollars. In fact, to emphasize this point, let's start referring to the quantities on the ledger as ledger dollars, or LD for short. You are, of course, free to exchange ledger dollars for real US dollars. For example, maybe Alice gives Bob a $10 bill in the real world. In exchange for him adding and signing the transaction, Bob pays Alice 10 ledger dollars to this communal ledger. But exchanges like that, they're not going to be guaranteed by the protocol. It's now more analogous to how you might exchange dollars for euros or any other currency on the open market. It's just its own independent thing. This is the first important thing to understand about Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency. What it is, is a ledger. The history of transactions is the currency. Of course, with Bitcoin, money doesn't enter the ledger with people buying in using cash. I'll get to how new money enters the ledger in just a few minutes. But before that, there's actually an even more significant difference between our current system of ledger dollars and how cryptocurrencies work. So far, I've said that this ledger is in some public place, like a website where anyone can add new lines. But that would require trusting a central location, namely, who hosts the website? Who controls the rules of adding new lines? To remove that bit of trust, we'll have everybody keep their own copy of the ledger. Then when you want to make a transaction, like Alice pays Bob 100 ledger dollars, what you do is broadcast that out into the world for people to hear and to record on their own private ledgers. But unless you do something more, this system is absurdly bad. How could you get everyone to agree on what the right ledger is? When Bob receives a transaction, like Alice pays Bob 10 ledger dollars, how can he be sure that everyone else received and believes that same transaction? That he'll be able to later on go to Charlie and use those same 10 ledger dollars to make a transaction? Really, imagine yourself just listening to transactions being broadcast. How can you be sure that everyone else is recording the same transactions and in the same order? This is really the heart of the issue. This is an interesting puzzle. Can you come up with a protocol for how to accept or reject transactions, and in what order, so that you can feel confident that anyone else in the world who's following that same protocol has a personal ledger that looks the same as yours. This is the problem addressed in the original Bitcoin paper. At a high level, the solution that Bitcoin offers is to trust whichever ledger has the most computational work put into it. I'll take a moment to explain exactly what that means it involves this thing called a cryptographic hash function. The general idea that we'll build to is that if you use computational work as a basis for what to trust, you can make it so that fraudulent transactions and conflicting ledgers would require an infeasible amount of computation to bring about. Again, I'll remind you that this is getting well into the weeds beyond what anyone would need to know just to use a currency like this. But it's a really cool idea, and if you understand it, you understand the heart of Bitcoin and of other crypto. Guys, let me just stop there for a moment. Does anybody have any questions or comments up to now? Hello? Anyone there? Yeah, we're here. Right. You will see, uh, by the way, uh, why do you think accountants were excited by Bitcoin? Transparent yes. transaction? Yeah, and it Perhaps. keeps well, uh, a track of all the transactions. Well, much the something much simpler than that. What's the word they keep using? Trust. Well, other than trust. That you use this word more often than trust. They describe it as a... Come, good accounting word. Ledger. As a ledger. Exactly. All right. Ledger is, of course, the bread and butter of accounting. Right in the old days, ledgers are actual physical books, right? That people used to write accounting transactions in. So that's what got accountants so excited. They say, "My God, this is accounting, and this is this is accounting, right?" But try and understand uh, what they're doing. I mean, what, what what this video is nice in is in showing, in building up the problem, showing all the things you had to overcome in order to get this trustless system to work. Okay, and now they're getting into the details of Bitcoin. 
which is this hash brown function. Now, you know, you may have to watch this video, or other videos like it, a couple of times to really understand what's happening. And even here, they're only giving you the surface, right? But just try and understand the concept here, right? That they're using technology to try and get a system of exchange that is trustless, right? In other words, if you trust the technology, you can trust that whatever is going to happen in the world will take place, okay? All right. Cryptocurrencies. So first things first, what's a hash function? The inputs for one of these functions can be any kind of message or file, it really doesn't matter. And the output is a string of bits with some kind of fixed length, like 256 bits. This output is called the hash or the digest of the message, and the intent is that it looks random. It's not random, it always gives the same output for a given input. But the idea is that if you slightly change the input, maybe editing just one of the characters, the resulting hash changes completely. In fact, for the hash function that I'm showing here, called SHA-256, the way the output changes as you slightly change that input is entirely unpredictable. You see, this is not just any hash function. It's a cryptographic hash function. That means it's infeasible to compute in the reverse direction. If I show you some string of ones and zeros and ask you to find an input so that the SHA-256 hash of that input gives this exact string of bits, you will have no better method than to just guess and check. And again, if you want to feel for how much computation would be needed to go through 2 to the 256 guesses, just take a look at the supplement video. I actually had way too much fun writing that thing. You might think that if you just really dig into the details of how exactly this function works, you could reverse engineer the appropriate input without having to guess and check. But no one has ever figured out a way to do that. Interestingly, there's no cold, hard, rigorous proof that it's hard to compute in the reverse direction. And yet, a huge amount of modern security depends on cryptographic hash functions and the idea that they have this property. If you were to look at what algorithms underlie the secure connection that your browser is making with YouTube right now, or that it makes with your bank, you will likely see the name SHA-256 show up in there. For right now, our focus will just be on how some... Hmm. We lost him. Again. Lost it. Dear, dear, I don't know why that's happening. Such a function can prove that a particular list of trans... God damn it. I don't know what's wrong with my connection. Uh, professor, maybe I can share my screen if you can send it sure. yeah. to me. Yeah, up to 14.34. Can you type the link to the chat room that I can? Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I, can, I, I cannot see you. <laughs> yeah, let me see. Chat. I did. There you go. Uh, can you? Uh, yeah, I'll stop sharing. What's the time? Uh, can you tell me the? Fourteen thirty-four. Fourteen thirty-four. Let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Can you hear the sound? No. You just got to go in there and change it to your system sound. Oh, okay. Me... Oh, oh, no, no. When you share it, just stop sharing. And when you go mm -hmm. back to sharing, press the little button that says optimize for video. Then the sound. Oh, okay. Go. Okay. Let me do it again then. Okay, share the sound. Okay. Can you? We'll just be on how such a function can yeah. prove that can a particular list yeah. of transactions. <laughs> 
is associated with a large amount of computational effort. Imagine someone shows you a list of transactions, and they say, hey, I found a special number, so that when you put that number at the end of this list of transactions, and apply SHA-256 to the entire thing, the first 30 bits of that output are all zeros. How hard do you think it was for them to find that number? Well, for a random message, the probability that a hash happens to start with 30 successive zeros is 1 in 2 to the 30, which is about 1 in a billion. And because SHA-256 is a cryptographic hash function, the only way to find a special number like that is just guessing and checking. So this person almost certainly had to go through about a billion different numbers before finding this special one. And once you know that number, it's really quick to verify. You just run the hash and see that there are 30 zeros. So in other words, you can verify that they went through a large amount of work, but without having to go through that same effort yourself. This is called a proof of work. And importantly, all of this work is intrinsically tied to the list of transactions. If you change one of those transactions, even slightly, it would completely change the hash. So you'd have to go through another billion guesses to find a new proof of work. A new number that makes it so that the hash of the altered list, together with this new number, starts with 30 zeros. So now think back to our distributed ledger situation. Everyone is there broadcasting transactions, and we want a way for them to agree on what the correct ledger is. As I said, the core idea behind the original Bitcoin paper is to have everyone trust whichever ledger has the most work put into it. The way this works is to first organize a given ledger into blocks, where each block consists of a list of transactions together with a proof of work. That is, a special number so that the hash of the whole block starts with a bunch of zeros. For the moment, let's say that it has to start with, oh, 60 zeros, but later we'll return back to a more systematic way you might want to choose that number. In the same way that a transaction is only considered valid when it's signed by the sender, a block is only considered valid if it has a proof of work. And also, to make sure that there's a standard order to these blocks, we'll make it so that a block has to contain the hash of the previous block at its header. That way, if you were to go back and change any one of the blocks, or to swap the order of two blocks, it would change the block that comes after it, which changes that block's hash which changes the one that comes after it, and so on. That would require redoing all of the work, finding a new special number for each of these blocks that makes their hashes start with 60 zeros. Because blocks are chained together like this, instead of calling it a ledger, it's common to call it a blockchain. As part of our updated protocol, we'll now allow anyone in the world to be a block creator. What that means is that they're going to listen for transactions being broadcast, collect them into some block, and then do a whole bunch of work to find a special number that makes the hash of that block start with 60 zeros. Then once they find it, they broadcast out the block that they found. To reward a block creator for all this work, when she puts together a block, we'll allow her to include a very special transaction at the top of it, in which she gets, say, 10 ledger dollars out of thin air. This is called the block reward, and it's an exception to our usual rules about whether or not to accept transactions. It doesn't come from anyone, so it doesn't have to be signed. And it also means that the total number of ledger dollars in our economy increases with each new block. Creating blocks is often called mining, since it requires doing a lot of work, and it introduces new bits of currency into the economy. But when you hear or read about miners, Keep in mind that what they're really doing is listening for transactions, creating blocks, broadcasting those blocks, and getting rewarded with new money for doing so. From the miner's perspective, each block is kind of like a miniature lottery, where everyone is guessing numbers as fast as they can until one lucky individual finds a special number that makes the hash of the block start with many zeros, and they get the reward. For anyone else who just wants to use this system to make payments, Instead of listening for transactions, they all start listening just for blocks being broadcast by miners and updating their own personal copies of the blockchain. Now the key addition to our protocol is that if you hear two distinct blockchains with conflicting transaction histories, you defer to the longest one, the one with the most work put into it. If there's a tie, just wait until you hear an additional block that makes one of them longer. So even though there's no central authority, 
and everyone is maintaining their own copy of the blockchain, if everyone agrees to give preference to whichever blockchain has the most work put into it, we have a way to arrive at decentralized consensus. To see why this makes for a trustworthy system, and to understand at what point you should trust that a payment is legit, it's actually really helpful to walk through exactly what it would take to fool someone using this system. Maybe Alice is trying to fool Bob with a fraudulent block. Namely, she tries to send him one that includes her paying him 100 ledger dollars, but without broadcasting that block to the rest of the network. That way, everyone else still thinks that she has those 100 ledger dollars. To do this, she would have to find a valid proof of work before all of the other miners, each working on their own block. And that could definitely happen. Maybe Alice just happens to win this miniature lottery before everyone else. But Bob is still going to be hearing the broadcasts made by other miners. So to keep him believing this fraudulent block, Alice would have to do all of the work herself to keep adding blocks on this special fork in Bob's blockchain that's different from what he's hearing from the rest of the miners. Remember, as per the protocol, Bob always trusts the longest chain that he knows about. Alice might be able to keep this up for a few blocks if, just by chance, she happens to find blocks more quickly than the rest of the miners on the network all combined. But unless she has close to 50% of the computing resources among all of the miners, the probability becomes overwhelming that the blockchain that all of the other miners are working on grows faster than the single fraudulent blockchain that Alice is feeding to Bob. So, after enough time, Bob's just going to reject what he's hearing from Alice in favor of the longer chain that everyone else is working on. Notice, that means that you shouldn't necessarily trust a new block that you hear immediately. Instead, you should wait for several new blocks to be added on top of it. If you still haven't heard of any longer blockchains, you can trust that this block is part of the same chain that everyone else is using. And with that, we've hit all the main ideas. This distributed ledger system, based on a proof of work, is more or less how the Bitcoin protocol works, and how many other cryptocurrencies work. There's just a few details to clear up. Earlier, I said that the proof of work might be to find a special number so that the hash of the block starts with 60 zeros. Well, the way the actual Bitcoin protocol works is to periodically change that number of zeros so that it should take, on average, 10 minutes to find a new block. So as there are more and more miners added to the network, the challenge actually gets harder and harder in such a way that this miniature lottery only has about one winner every 10 minutes. Many newer cryptocurrencies actually have much shorter block times than that. And all of the money in Bitcoin ultimately comes from some block reward. In the beginning, these rewards were 50 Bitcoin per block. There's actually a great website you can go to called Block Explorer that makes it easy to look through the Bitcoin blockchain. And if you look at the very first few blocks on the chain, they contain no transactions other than that 50 Bitcoin reward to the miner. But every 210,000 blocks, which is about every four years, that reward gets cut in half. So right now, the reward is 12.5 Bitcoin per block. And because this reward decreases geometrically over time, it means there will never be more than 21 million Bitcoin in existence. However, this doesn't mean that miners will stop earning money. In addition to the block reward, miners can also pick up transaction fees. The way this works is that whenever you make a payment, you can purely optionally include a little transaction fee with it that's going to go to the miner of whichever block includes that payment. The reason you might do that is to incentivize miners to actually include the transaction that you broadcast into the next block. You see, in Bitcoin, each block is limited to about 2400 transactions which many critics argue is unnecessarily restrictive. For comparison, Visa processes an average of about 1,700 transactions per second, and they're capable of handling more than 24,000 per second. This comparatively slow processing on Bitcoin makes for higher transaction fees, since that's what determines which transactions miners choose to include in a new block. All of this is far from a comprehensive coverage of cryptocurrencies, there are still many nuances and alternate design choices that I haven't even touched. But my hope is that this can provide a stable wait but why style tree trunk of understanding for anyone looking to add a few more branches with further reading. 
Like I said at the start, one of the motives behind this is that a lot of money has started flowing towards cryptocurrencies. And even though I don't want to make any claims about whether that's a good or bad investment, I really do think that it's healthy for people getting into the game to at least know the fundamentals of the technology. As always, my sincerest thanks to those of you making this channel possible on Patreon. I understand that not everyone is in a position to contribute, but if you're still interested in helping out, one of the best ways to do that is... Okay, right, so I hope you found that useful. Sorry for making you watch such a long video, All right, but I think it's a, it's a very helpful one, right? It covers a lot of ground, but not everything, right? Uh, I'm going to stop for a break in a moment. I just want to show you what this hash function is, right? Because that is uh, the whole fundamental purpose. Is, of it, it, right? I, uh, is it possible to share the link of that video so that... Yes, uh, I would like that too. To be yeah, yeah, it's, it's there. Yeah. It's there in chat. It's already it's the there. Chat? Yeah. But I mean, it's not the only video, right? There's yeah, of course. Of other, yeah. <laughs> there's tons of other ones. So my, my, my point is you should just look around. I just found that by yeah. chance. Uh, but Michael, yeah. this is a good one. So it yeah, is, it, it's looked, a very it, good it looked one. good and yeah. I, I didn't get to watch the whole thing because I had to yeah. disconnect but, and reconnect. So. But I, I just want to, uh, before we stop for a break, just want to show you what's meant by a hash generator, right? So uh, here is one, right? So I'm going to write in an, some text. Right. Okay. And what it does is it converts, uh, let's just use 256. Right. That's the one they talked about. Right. Oops. Okay. So it takes this text, Miklos Vasaheli, and converts it into this. Uh, this set of numbers, all right? So let me just copy that number there, right? And just show you what happens, all right? So this Miklos Vazaheli text has been converted into this number here. Amazing. God damn it, what's going on? Hold on. All right, so there's the text. Okay, that's the hash for Miklos Vasaheli. Now let's go back to that and let us change the f just one thing. Instead of capital M, let's put little m. Okay, and there's a new hash. Okay, and let's compare it. And you can see it's completely different. Okay, right? Just that one change made it totally different. And this is that technology that they're talking about. All right, that they can take the information in a block, right, and they convert it into this hash function, right, into this, and they know, and you, everyone knows, if you make even the slightest change here, all right, it will change everything. Okay, every aspect of the pro of that the number will change completely if you make the smallest change. So let's just go back and look at our syllabus okay so here's our syllabus here all right so let me cut and paste it all right so now i'm going to put the syllabus in here all right and there's the hash right so this is the entire syllabus is now in here all right and we got the hash here so let's put it here and show it just keep a track record of it Okay, now let me make one change, right? So we got this whole syllabus here, right? All this. Let me just change this from 73 to 74. That's the only change in this entire document. Here's our new hash. And look at it. Completely different. Okay, so that's the enormous power of this hash function, right? Now, that's just a mathematical trick, you might say, right? Okay, but what Bitcoin does or what Nakamoto did was recognize that using something like this enables you to create this, this trustless system, right? Of course, not just that. The fact that he thought about creating these blocks or putting the hash inside the block or linking them, 
and all these other subsidiary technologies, these Merkle trees and this and that, all of them he put together to create this system. And it is an absolutely brilliant piece of ingenuity. I mean, one of the greatest achievements of humanity, I think, all right, to come up with something like this. Okay. Now, that's just one small aspect of Bitcoin, all right? And Bitcoin is not the same as blockchain. Blockchain is the underlying technology. You can also see the problems, right? In order to validate these blocks, you, you have to create this very challenging problem. The problem itself is utterly irrelevant, right? Nobody, the, the problem is like kind, you know, finding uh, a number with 42 zeros or something, all right? You know, that's also, that problem has nothing to do with the content of the block. It's just a hurdle that you have to overcome, a hurdle that's sufficiently challenging enough that nobody could do it just in order, you know, it's not worth it for someone to try and do that problem in order to commit fraud. All right. So this is a pure transaction cost. Okay. So uh, uh -huh. I have a question. Like in, like in the point of view that we just make an ident identification string, then why don't we just make like QR code or barcode? That, that's the same actually in, in, in that perspective. Then what, what was well, effectively, uh, your private key is like a barcode, right? But the point is that, you know, if you give somebody a barcode, they could copy it, right? So it would no longer be trustless. Okay? Yeah. Remember that, right? This is, has to be, this is for a world in which nobody trusts each other and nobody has to trust each other. Okay? So that's why he, he had to come up with this elaborately complicated system, right? To deal with that. Because... Almost every other transaction requires trust, like MasterCard or Visa. You trust that they will pay it, they have the money to pay it, and so on, right? But there is a drawback to this. Because of this high transaction cost of data mining, all right, uh, you probably heard uh, earlier this week, uh, they announced that now Bitcoin mining uses as much electricity as the whole of Argentina, all right? Uh, you know, it's an enormous weight. Of loss, something like 10 or 15 percent of all the carbon emissions on earth right now are caused by Bitcoin mining. Okay, so that's a tremendous cost to society, and if you really can't get away from it because if you reduce that cost, it becomes easier to cheat. All right, so you saw they mentioned that there's other uh, cryptocurrencies which, which don't take as long to verify, right? But they're inherently less secure because that the amount of deadweight loss to verify a transaction is not a bug it's a feature of the system it is what is necessary to create trustless transactions right so if you make it very low then it becomes easy to cheat okay and so if bitcoin continues it will eventually use all the electricity on earth right because it will become harder and harder and harder right instead of finding uh, verifying with 40 zeros it'll become verifying with 5000 zeros or something like that right it's designed to become harder and harder as computing power becomes is faster and faster right so it's a it's like an arms race again he thought of all of these things right this fellow all right but that is a drawback and look at the transactions he said it's one block every 10 minutes okay and each block has 2400 characters all right visa can do 1700 a second Okay, so, you know, it's very hard to scale blockchain, all right? Because trust is a great way of scaling. If you trust somebody, you're willing to do a lot of things, right, with that person without requiring verification. But if you don't trust them, then you have to have a high cost of verification and that becomes something that you just can't get around. So there's a lot of questions about whether blockchain can be used, right? So they mentioned Ethereum. Ethereum is a sort of open source software that is used to create your own blockchains. They have their own currency and they were going to move away from data mining to other forms of verification. But that has been indefinitely delayed because people realize that if you came up with a simpler way of verification, it is inherently less trusted. Okay. Anyway, that's the underlying technology of it, right? If you are going to do research in this field, obviously you need to know a lot more than 
what is mentioned here. You have to really understand the underlying technology. And there's other PhD students who've done that who can help you uh, or faculty members like me, Klaus and Alex and people like that. Not me, right? I'm not, I don't have that kind of technology basics. I mean, this is really high level stuff, right? But let's take a 10 minute break till eight o'clock and then I'll come back and we'll talk about applying blockchain uh, to AIS uh, topics, okay? Any, hello? Yes, professor, we're yes. here. Miklos, are you there? Yeah. I am here. Right here. Miklos, you heard the news from Ivy? I think our new students will be very excited to hear about our old student. Uh, I heard the news, but I don't didn't know it was public yet. No, she just wrote an email to us. So you might be interested to know, all of you, that one of our students just got a job offer from the University of Florida. That's an amazing accomplishment, right? It just goes to show. And she's in her third year, is she not, Miklos? Yes, and she also has an offer from University of Miami, where yes. Roman and Christina. Yeah, so there you go. Let that be an inspiration to you. Right? Just in three years from now, you can, I mean, that's very unusual, right? For someone to get a job in three years. But she yes, did a master's she, here, right? She was an MIT student, Master of Information Technology. And she actually took the audit class with me while she was a master's student and yeah. did a, a capstone course. So she, she has... Uh, a little bit more than three years. Correct. So it's like four years, but still, that's a very wonderful smart. achievement. Very she's good. Very right? smart. Yeah. Right. So, and she and has, uh, she's working on AI, which all of you should think about potentially doing. Yep. And she has an A publication already, another on the way. So. And the R and R. Yes. So amazing accomplishment. So there you go. Let that be inspiration to you. Okay. All right. So let's go back to uh, blockchain. Right. The, you know. <laughs> That, that was a sort of introduction. You know, nobody would expect you to be an expert on blockchain after looking at that, right? But, you know, it gives you a starting point to understand the scale of the achievement of it, right? And ever since then, it has taken off, right? And uh, the underlying technology, the, the, the logic behind it is what's called blockchain and which is now used in all manner of different applications, all right? And the... the, the the key takeaway from that is that by using technology, you can create uh, the ability to monitor transactions. Okay. And it has other things too. I mean, it's designed to facilitate transactions, right? The, you know, exchanging uh, cryptocurrency. But the, you know, the sort of side effect of that is that you're creating a new database, right? A database where every person knows, you know, has a ledger of everybody else, of all the transactions that have ever taken place, right? So this is why it's called a distributed ledger, okay? So, you know, the, the word, you know, distributed, meaning for a, the way we think of ledgers in a company in accounting is that there is one central ledger, which used to be, you know, in giant pile of books and now is in the database of an ERP system. But there's one, right? Then that is stored by the company. Right, but under distributed ledgers, it is spread to every person involved uh, has access to this ledger. Okay, and so that's a very different way of thinking about knowledge. Right, that instead of keeping it to yourself, everybody has it. Now, of course, it's encrypted. You know, you can't go backwards and so on. Right, so it, it's not to say that everything is fully transparent, but in theory, at least you don't have knowledge that is restricted to people. So that's something that people find uh, very uh, desirable, okay? <coughs> right, the fact that there is no intermediary, no middle person, right, who is involved, like a bank, right, is one of the things that really appealed to a lot of people. Initially, the people who were very excited about blockchain were libertarians, sort of right-wing nuts, right? Once we had this fellow come to Rutgers and he spoke to us and he was really gung-ho about the fact that he no longer has to fit, trust the U.S. Federal Reserve, right? You know, his money <laughs> is safe. Yes. Do you remember that? I mean, you know, no, who was that? Uh, I don't know. Some character came and talked like that. You know, so those libertarians were the ones who were first into this, but that's only with cryptocurrencies, right? What's really, uh, you know, what a lot of people are excited about is is the concept of blockchain as a database, all right? And the ability to store and exchange information in a way that everybody trusts that, right? This is known as a single point of truth. 
right? That everybody knows everything that everybody else knows. Okay, and so you can easily verify something. All right, this is something that's extremely helpful. For example, let's say you're shipping containers from uh, a factory in China to uh, a store in New Jersey. All right, <coughs> all manner of transactions take place. Along that way, all manner of documents are required: customs document, bills of lading, inspections, things, health form, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. <coughs> all this used to be done on paper, and it used to be stuck to the container, and so on. And then they could be lost and damaged, and so forth. And now people are experimenting with putting these documents into a blockchain, so that anybody anywhere can download it. So if you are customs official. Uh, in the port of Los Angeles, you can download all the transactions, all the documentation going all the way back to the factory to verify that what's in this container is what was uh, made in this factory in Guangzhou or someplace. Okay. <coughs> another way, another uh, way of very of using the blockchain is to establish uh, provenance. Right, provenance meaning where did something come from. Okay, so if, if you you know there are TV shows now uh, on you know where you can watch right where somebody comes to, you know somebody discovers some painting in an attic, okay, and they want to know whether this painting is by you know Leonardo da Vinci, all right, and the way that the experts do it is they look at you know on the one hand they look at the style, but if the style is similar to da Vinci, say, then they have to try and trace back who owned the painting. For the last 550 years, all the way back to Da Vinci, can you show that there is this chain of ownership going all the way back to the studio of Da Vinci? That's how you establish provenance, right? Okay, and it's very difficult because you know you don't have records going back 550 years, or if it is, it's spread all over the place, and you have to go dig through some monasteries' records uh, on paper and so forth, right? Okay, but with blockchain, you could put. The provenance, you could put documentation from the act of creation all the way to the current point in time that shows exactly who owned this product, who handled it, who touched it, and so on. Okay? So, for example, uh, if you're talking about drugs, all right, if you're worried that drugs will become counterfeit uh, at some point in the value chain, you can upload onto this blockchain documentation showing the drugs from beginning to end, from manufacture all the way to in your hand and say who, uh, you know, who was it that was involved with this? So there's full transparency in the supply chain. All right. This became particularly uh, uh, of interest uh, to China, right? Because as the Chinese students probably, probably remember, uh, there was a scandal with milk, baby, baby milk, right? Baby formula a few years ago. All right. And that created a lot of concern about the supply chain. Uh, in China, all right, and so uh, people started interesting saying, you know, can we create a way of tracking exactly where this product came from, all right, or proving that this this particular baby formula is actually from Nestle or you know whoever manufactured it, all right, it hasn't been adulterated or opened or anything like that, okay, and so there's lots and lots of examples uh, like this, okay, and in the process it led people to modify uh, you know, the Bitcoin process because after all, Bitcoin was not designed for supply chains, right? Bitcoin was designed for cryptocurrency, okay? And what's more, it was cryptocurrency in a world with zero trust. I mean, that was the whole point. He, whoever this fellow was, he didn't want to trust banks, all right? He wanted to be able to have a currency where there was no involvement by government, all right? So one of the first people to use uh, bitcoins were drug dealers, okay, on the dark web, right? Because they didn't want governments, obviously, to know what they were doing and arms traders and stuff like that, okay? And so they started using bitcoin as a way of avoiding, uh, you know, uh, monitoring by tax authorities or law enforcement agencies or whoever, okay? But, you know, that creates, that to work, operate in such a world with zero trust, Right, like between a drug dealer and a drug uh, trafficker, all right, that requires a lot of infrastructure that we saw in this video. All right, all that technology about 
uh, crypto, you know, caching and this and that, right? I mean, if you are Walmart and you are trying to create a, a blockchain with your suppliers, I mean, there is some trust there, right? And so do you really need this elaborate structure? And the answer was, no, you don't, right? You can, res- you can relax some of those assumptions. And that's how you ended up with what's called private blockchains, all right? Because in a public blockchain like Bitcoin, nobody knows who everybody, anybody else is. It's all anonymous, okay? <clears throat> you know, that Tom, Dick, Canary and all that they gave in that example, you don't actually need to know who those people are. You just need to know that I have something they want, they have something I want, and we do an exchange. And as long as that's down the Bitcoin uh, exchange, they, you know, it can operate without trust, right? Because of those restrictions on double spending and so on. Okay. But, you know, if I, if I am Walmart and I'm buying shampoo from Procter & Gamble, well, I know who you are, right? So I don't really need all that uh, infrastructure for a trustless world. And so you can relax it, as I said, and go, for example, to a private blockchain where it's not, uh, you know, thousands of anonymous people. It's 50 people who know each other. Okay. And so you still have some of the elements like the distributed ledger, but you don't have the elaborate mining, right? You know, you can just have, you know, you can buy, have agreement by consensus that everybody has the same ledger because it's a restricted number of people. Okay. So, there were there are a lot of so-called private <coughs> uh, permissioned blockchains, as they're called. Permissioned meaning that the people in the blockchain give permission for you to join, while Bitcoin, by definition, is permissionless. Nobody is in charge. Nobody can stop you from getting onto the Bitcoin or participating in it. Okay. Now, there's a pushback. A lot of people say, no, hang on. A permissioned blockchain is by definition not a blockchain, all right? Because without all that infrastructure for a trustless environment, you know, why do you bother having this distributed ledger at all, all right? In fact, people say, you know, perhaps what you need is not a distributed ledger, it's just a ledger, all right? You know, we'll just declare that this one ledger is the point of, is the source of truth then why do we need to go through this elaborate distributed ledger stuff, right? So, for example, Walmart might say, look, we are the biggest player. We are going to keep, we are going to have a database. Everybody who sells to us is going to enter all their documentation into this database. And anybody wants to check, they can go to our database and have a look. All right? Again, as long as you trust Walmart, right? Well, there's your truth right there. You don't need all the other elaborate infrastructure like the mining and so on that can make blockchain so expensive uh, and time consuming to use. Okay. So, you know, that's the kind of push and pull that comes with any technology. All right. People come up uh, with with applications. Some people say it's not a correct application. Right. And maybe it's not, but maybe it serves their purposes and so on. Right. And, And there's hundreds and thousands of research papers out there on all these aspects. Right. You know, whether it's permission or permissionless, right? Uh, You know, they mentioned Ethereum. Ethereum, as I say, is now one of the biggest bit, uh, one of the biggest blockchain entities. It's one that it's an open source software uh, operated by uh, IBM, I believe, and micro. I mean, part of them is operated by them, not all of it. All right. And anybody can go there and use that as a sort of operating system to create their own blockchain uh, based solutions. All right. So instead of having to create every part of it yourself, you just piggyback onto Ethereum. And Ethereum is also verified using its own cryptocurrency called Ether. Okay. All right. And, you know, there's pros and cons to that. But for example, I was watching a presentation by ENY uh, last year where they have created an interaction with Ethereum. Right. And so they will go to a client and set up a blockchain for that client using Ethereum as the technological backbone. Okay, and they create the interface uh, to that. All right, and so they sell that as a service. So lots of, you know, there are lots of solutions out there. As they pointed out, there are, uh, you know, thousands of cryptocurrencies out there. There's even a website which shows all the cryptocurrencies that have failed, right? Okay, but on the other hand, (coughs) people have used uh, this concept of Bitcoin in a very innovative way. Right. So you may have heard of initial coin offerings. Right. That's an alternative to venture capital. 
right? Because venture capital is where, you know, you have a lot of gatekeepers who are very powerful and who keep all the benefits of venture capital themselves. Of course, they also take on a lot of risk, all right? But under initial coin offerings, anybody can participate in venture capital, all right? They essentially buy a coin, which is the cyber currency issued by the firm. And that cyber currency, if the, if the firm is successful, if the venture is successful, will gain in value. And so essentially you can invest uh, in a startup uh, that way and, and so on and so forth. And that has created its own literature about whether that's a good thing to do, whether it needs regulation and so on and, and so forth. Okay. So, <clears throat> right. There have been lots of papers written on this topic in accounting. Right. I want to talk about uh, some of them. All right. There's, I have a lot of PowerPoints here. I have okay. a question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I, yeah. So, uh, I mean, based on like what this sounds like, I mean, doesn't that make, bring more transparency into a certain transactions uh, in a company? So, for example, if they uh, have um, a blockchain, even like a private blockchain between the uh, supply chain, um, I mean, is that, isn't that in a sense making the auditor's job better because they can tap into that and see that they can verify? Oh, yes, exactly, exactly, yeah, right? right? And, and you'll see that in this presentation uh, by June Dai. It's actually a paper with Miklos, right? One of the most highly cited papers in JETA or GIS, I can't remember. Anyway, right? Uh, and you can find this paper quite easily, right? So they put forward in 2017 this paper, you know, and so they spent some, you know, <laughs> The early papers uh, in blockchain had to spend a lot of time explaining what it was, right? Because a lot of people didn't know. And then they move on to offering uh, solutions, right? But, but, you know, this is just one of many, 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 many papers that have been written on all manner of different aspects of it, all right? So, in fact, before I get into this, let me talk about another one of the most uh, important parts of this, right, of blockchain, right? Because blockchain puts every transaction on this anonymous web, right? On the blocks, okay? Where there's no parties involved, everything is done electronically. And that opens up the possibilities of doing a lot of innovative things, okay? And one of the most important of it is what's called a smart contract, all right? A smart contract is basically a program set of transactions, all right? Where nobody has to be physically involved, right? It's, it's basically a sort of if then statements. So if this happens, then make this transaction and pay somebody so much money. All right. I mean, now, you know, you might say that's not such a big deal, right? I mean, anybody who has automated bill payment with their bank is, have, does has a smart contract, right? It says, you know, when the credit card bill comes into my account, pay it using available funds. All right. That's, that's a smart contract. Okay. But what smart contracts do is put it on the blockchain itself. Okay. And that has a, a number of benefits, right? Meaning that it is, since it since the transaction appears on the block, right? It is, as you say, fully transparent and verified. And what's more, that data remains forever, all right? Blockchains are what are called, um, what do you call it? Um, Permanent. Yeah, yeah. There's another word they use, right? Uh, Eternal. Right? Well, yeah, eternal, but it's more than that. Anyway, I can't remember. But there is some word that they, that is used that means, as Miklos said, permanent, right? It is there forever. All right? So it will never, you, you will never lose that transaction. It's not like that, you know, the company burns down and all the books of the company are lost. All right? Since the ledger is distributed, there are copies everywhere and they maintain every everybody's ledger has every transaction going back to the first one, all right? So on that website, he showed you the very first transaction on blockchain. And he knows that because everybody knows that. It's on everybody's ledger, right? So that's a huge uh, advantage of this. Now, again, understand why that's true, right? That's an artifact of the fact that he's trying to prevent double spending, right? So his solution to that is to distribute the ledger, right? But other people can take advantage of that sort of, ancillary part of blockchain, right, to make that the central aspect of the problem, right? In fact, there is some videos here. Let me find a video on uh, smart contracts. Just a very quick one, 
because that I think is also a very important one for accountants. All right, because our job is very fine transactions, and if you have something that is uh, done on the web, all right, that makes it um, much easier for accountants to actually verify it. Let me see. Okay, here, here's a simple one, all right, which I think is quite nice. Contract automatically passes the money to the creator of the project. And contracts are very popular nowadays. But what are they and what problems do they solve? The term smart contract was first used by Nick Sabo in 1997, long before Bitcoin was created. He is a computer scientist, law scholar and cryptographer, so I'll spare you his exact words. But in simple terms, he wanted to use a distributed ledger to store contracts. Now, smart contracts are just like contracts in the real world. The only difference is that they are completely digital. In fact, a smart contract is actually a tiny computer program that is stored inside of a blockchain. Let's take a look at an example to understand how smart contracts work. You probably are familiar with Kickstarter, the large fundraising platform. Product teams can go to Kickstarter, create a project, set a funding goal, and start collecting money from others who believe in the idea. Kickstarter is essentially a third party that sits in between product teams and supporters. This means that both of them need to trust Kickstarter to handle their money correctly. If the project gets successfully funded, the project team expects Kickstarter to give them their money. On the other hand, supporters want their money to go to the project if it was funded, or to get a refund when it hasn't reached its goals. Both the product team and its supporters have to trust Kickstarter. But with smart contracts, we can build a similar system that doesn't require a third party like Kickstarter. So let's create a smart contract for this. We can program the smart contract so that it holds all the received funds until a certain goal is reached. The supporters of a project can now transfer their money to the smart contract. If the project gets fully funded, the contract automatically passes the money to the creator of the project. And if the project fails to meet these goals, then the money automatically goes back to the supporters. Pretty awesome, right? And because smart contracts are stored inside a blockchain, everything is completely distributed. With this technique, no one is in control of the money. But wait a minute, why should we trust the smart contract? Well, because smart contracts are stored on a blockchain, they inherit some interesting properties. They are immutable and they are distributed. Being immutable means that once a smart contract is created, it can never be changed again. So no one can go behind your back and tamper with the code of your contract. And being distributed means that the output of your contract is validated by everyone on the network. So a single person cannot force the contract to release the funds because other people on the network will spot this attempt and mark it as invalid. Tampering with smart contracts becomes almost impossible. Smart contracts can be applied to many different things, not just on crowdfunding. Banks, for example, could use it to issue loans or to offer automatic payments. Insurance companies could use it to process certain claims. And postal companies could use it for payment on delivery and so on and so on. So now you might wonder, where and how can I use smart contracts? Well, right now, there are a handful of blockchains who support smart contracts, but the biggest one is Ethereum. It was specifically created and designed to support smart contracts. Smart contracts can be programmed in a special programming language called Solidity. This language was specifically created for Ethereum and uses a syntax that resembles JavaScript. It's also worth noting that Bitcoin also has support for smart contracts, although it's a lot more limited compared to Ethereum. So now you know what smart contracts are and what problems they solve. I hope you enjoyed this video. Okay, so you can see that this is four years ago, right? So things have changed a bit, lot since then. But as they point out, Bitcoin was not designed for smart contracts, right? I mean, it's a technology platform for currencies. So that's why they created Ethereum and other blockchain applications that are more geared towards it, right? Now, again, that example from Kickstarter, I think, is a very nice one, right? Kickstarter is the trusted source, okay? But, you know, you, you should ask yourselves, 
is that all they do right you know do they for example filter some of the the kickstarter applications themselves right i mean it's easy enough to say you know and, and it was very common especially in blockchain was start to say oh you know all these third party intermediaries are useless and they'll be gotten rid of with blockchain right but sometimes they do in fact serve a purpose right they serve as a filter okay they serve as a regulator so you can't say that all third party intermediaries are useless and can be replaced by technology maybe they can maybe they can't but it requires you to understand what role they play right so for example auditors right uh, you know if you say well if you, everything is on the web and everything is verified we don't need auditing anymore all right well is that the only role auditors play right well no auditors also for example help their clients understand the accounting all right so you know that's not going to be solved by having blockchain right some people say auditors serve as insurance company a deep pocket in case something goes wrong right that can't be fixed using blockchain right so when you do research in this area you have to understand the institution you're trying to replace with the blockchain and make sure you realize all the aspects uh, of the thing they do okay we're running out of time so let me just quickly jump into some of the stuff right so uh, this paper by june and miklos i mean you can read it yourself obviously all right uh, let me just quickly go through it there's a lot of slides on it so i can't go through all of it All right, so they start off by talking about uh, the technology. I mean, we don't need. Uh, I like this little example. She obviously got married. Uh, yes. Right at the time, I suppose Miklos was there, maybe. Right, and I was. So, I was. I was here in Long oh, Island. <laughs> so there you go. Right. So she, yeah. the logic pair in blockchain is why do people have big weddings, right? Uh, and you know, a wedding is a is you know, outside COVID times. a communal activity because you want everybody to know these two people are actually married to each other because otherwise they could go commit bigamy right so they could be married to someone else exactly right so by doing it in public with all the witnesses in fact under uh, anglo saxon common law you need a witness to a, a wedding a actual formal witness all right it's a way of establishing that these two people are married to each other now okay and what you know and so in sort of when you have all those people there they serve as a sort of institutional memory that yeah i was there at june uh, june dai's wedding okay and th that's what a blockchain does they they spread that memory uh, to lots of uh, to everybody all right so i think that's a very nice little example okay anyway she goes into it and she talks about you know here all the big four and all the stuff that they're doing right tremendous amount that they're doing okay i'm not going to go into this right this is something we already saw i want to get into uh, i have no idea what homophobic home homomorphic encryption is so these not are some of the it's not homophobic it's <laughs> homomorphic yes these are some of the underlying techno you know stuff behind it right and by the way this zabo uh, is some real genius in computer science and it's some people Hungarian. Miklos, oh, really? Miklos sabo they he called oh. himself nicolas yeah i was watching a youtube video yesterday where some people are speculating who nakamoto is and apparently this man is one of the uh, leaning leading candidates for nakamoto himself and mr mr nakamoto has something like 20 billion dollars yeah. in yeah. bitcoin chips if yeah, because, he exists yeah because that's obviously that's why everyone is so interested <laughs> because he obviously <laughs> when he sure billion, he got a not million b yeah, billion b billion yeah he obviously made sure that he was given a good Uh, endowment when he started it. I mean, why not? I mean, he invented it, right? Anyway, all right. So I'm not going to go into all this background stuff. I want to get to the second part of the paper, which is their their discussion of how this applied to uh, auditing. Okay. All right. So, for example, in their paper, they talk about triple entry, right? Triple entry is this old idea that in order to make sure that accounting records are correct, instead of just having debits and credits inside the company. you should have a third party that keeps also a copy of the accounting that way the company cannot cheat okay and their third party can verify that um you know your your purchase from another company matches their sales from another company all right that they never was that there's automatic confirmation right and the weakness of this proposal which was proposed by a famous accountant called Ejiri you know decades ago was that you know who would maintain 
who we, who this third party be, right? You know, companies obviously did not want the government to be that third party, right? Because then they would know what was happening inside the company and they would make sure they paid taxes and stuff like that. And so uh, Miklos and, and June Dai pointed out that, you know, blockchain could be a great use. It could be that trust third party because you don't need trust and it's it's publicly available it's transparent but encrypted and so on so that could be one example of it and in their paper they discuss uh, how that might uh, go about how that might happen and they talk about technologies like tokenization uh, and so on again i'm not going to go into all those details right uh, just know that this is an example of how you could use a blockchain in that sense Okay, and so they could be used for automatic information and verification. Okay, and that information, you know, could be made available to third parties like shareholders and so on. Again, whether that would happen, you know, you would need to have restrictions on confidential information and so on. But in theory, right, by having all this information on the blockchain, you know, it's a distributed ledger. That's the whole point. Everybody would know it. Okay, now, again, I'll come to that in a moment, whether you really want to do that or not. Okay, and a lot of things that companies do could be transferred into a smart contract. And again, right, notice what that video said, right, that the smart contract, you know, why is it different from having a, a bill payment with your bank, right? Because it is immutable. That's the word I was looking for. Immutable meaning it cannot be changed, right? So, the, you know, we, no one can, you know, in the bank thing, you can go back and change it, right? And say, oh, no, you, you know, you you thought you told me to pay, but I you know I took the money and ran off with it, right? By changing that contract, by being on the blockchain, because of all the verification, it, once it's on the con once it's on the block, it can never be changed. So everybody can see exactly what it was that was supposed to happen under what conditions. Okay, so that's a huge uh, advantage of smart contracts. I mean, that's what makes them so attractive to people. All right, and so. Uh, you know, that can be very helpful in an accounting setting, right? So if you're an auditor, you know, you know, you can see on the record, on the block itself, exactly what was supposed to happen, whether it happened, how it happened, when it happened, and so on, all right? So that would certainly facilitate uh, accounting, okay? <coughs> all right, and then they go talk about permission contracts and so on, okay? I'm not going to go into all of that, all right? Uh, however, <coughs> Okay, and then they talk about smart controls and so on. But I want you to go back to this for a moment. All right. So, right, what they're suggesting is that, all right, that this, all the transactions of the company would be on a blockchain. Okay. And so the auditor could go back and verify all these transactions. Okay. However, right, <clears throat> later on, I think someone pointed out, Glenn maybe, all right. I mean, think about how this would work, right? The information on this blockchain is encrypted, right? Obviously, because otherwise every, everybody would know everything about the company. So it's encrypted. So who has the key to the encryption, right? I mean, actually, I think this point was raised by someone, maybe Glenn, at our last conference, right? <clears throat> so somebody has to have the key to de-encrypt this, right? So that the auditor could verify what was taking place. Maybe the auditor has the key, right? But that, of course, requires trust, right? It requires trust that the person holding the key, right, will produce it, right, uh, when required, okay? So we are moving away from a trustless world when we do that. Now, you may be happy with that, right? You say, why not we trust the auditors now? Why wouldn't we trust it then, right? But the point is, it's not a pure blockchain at that point. Okay, and, and that's the point, right? Some of these solutions move away from Bitcoin, which is fine, right? Because Bitcoin is its own product. It's not meant to be an accounting system, all right? But if you're using the underlying technology, you have to make sometimes, you have to make some compromises, okay? So for example, the level of verification that's in Bitcoin is, is really not feasible for, you know, for a company, Right. They, they can't only be doing 2,400 transactions every 10 minutes. I mean, that's just impossible, okay? So then you end up with lower lower level security. You may even end up with a permissioned blockchain in which there is really no security, where one party decides what is correct transactions or not, all right? Just like happens now with a modern database. So at that point, 
you know, you have this continuum between a regular database and a blockchain database, right? Okay, Bitcoin is at one end of the extreme, right? But as you relax the assumptions, you become closer and closer to a, to a ledger, right? To a regular database, right? And that's where the issue arises. Do you need a database? Uh, do you need a ledger? Do you need a distributed ledger? Or will just a plain old ledger do? Okay, and again, these are questions that has to be addressed when you come up with your product and your solution. Okay, <clears throat> all right, and so um, here's what uh, Miklos was suggesting, all right, that, you know, we have this company, it's doing all these transactions, and those transactions appear on the blockchain layer, and then we have this smart control layer, which is like a smart contract, but it's, it's, it's performing analysis in real time of the data in the blockchain layer, okay, <clears throat> all right, and the, this mirror world, that's an interesting concept. It's, it's, it's what's known as a digital twin, all right? Because since everything is now taking place digitally, all right, you can actually create a mirror of that where somebody can have only read-only access. They can just observe it to see what's happening without being influencing it at all, okay? And that would be an ideal platform for an auditor to act. Niklas, am I missing something here? I always say... Google Maps is a digital mirror. It's not a physical world, but represents properly the world. And so what we are trying, you're saying it correctly. Uh, what uh, I usually say is uh, the auditor has a map of what the company is doing to a mirror world, and he can do all kinds of analytics without affecting the company to the mirror. Yeah, right. So... This, I think, you know, and I mean, if you apply the same logic to Bitcoin, that underlying uh, thing at the bottom are these Harry giving $20 to Sally and so on, right? Okay, I mean, that's the real, they're trying to mirror transactions taking place, right? Okay, and so they're trying to match that, right? I'll come back to this in a moment when I talk about a paper that I actually wrote with my friend Glenn Gray, okay? <clears throat> All right, but you know, there are lots of challenges, meaning lots of research opportunities for people like you in the next few years, right? To look at that, right? Blockchain, as I, as I said, is highly demanding, right? And, and again, that's not a, sorry, not blockchain. That it should say Bitcoin is highly demanding, right? Blockchain may or may not be. Bitcoin is highly demanding of storage and computational power. And that's by design. It is not, uh, it is not something that is a, a mistake or a problem that you can try and get away from, right? That is the essence of Bitcoin. It has to be challenging because otherwise it will lose its characteristics, all right? So the question is, is it possible to have the level of security that Bitcoin has without using all the energy of Argentina? And I think the answer is no, it is not possible, right? So that, that's a trade-off that you have to make, okay? Between, between security versus consumption between deadweight loss, right? Because it is an enormous deadweight loss. I mean, to use up so much electricity, right, in time of global climate change is obviously, you know, not sustainable, okay? <clears throat> you know, it's not just researchers, the actual startup companies out there that are trying to create blockchain-based solutions for accounting and assurance purposes, right? So uh, what's the name of that company, Miklos, that uh, Rod is... Rod is involved with... Uh, oh, Luca. Yeah, Luca, right? So that's based on Luca Pacioli, the father of accounting. All right? Uh, so... But they misspelled you know. it. It's not, it should be L-U-C-A. And they do L-U-C-K-K-A. And you guys okay. are going to hear a little bit about it because both Katrina and Philip are doing research with them. And Philip will be defending his dissertation in a couple of months. So you can... Enjoy first light Philip's discussion of his model to measure cryptocurrencies um, and uh, basically a thing called stablecoin. Yeah, so I mean, I, as I understand it, what that company does is that they facilitate the accounting for cyber currencies, right? Okay, yeah, so they, they do accounting for cyber currency, hopefully, auditing for cy yeah, cyber yeah. currencies. However, I think the wealth <laughs> is the fact that they have data for pretty much all U.S. exchanges that no one else has. 
Yeah. So, I mean, there are a lot of opportunities there, right? You know, for example, right now, the regulators, the accounting regulators are having a lot of discussion about how to change accounting standards for a blockchain world. I mean, something like cyber currencies. Now that cyber currencies are on the balance sheet of companies, how should they be reported, valued and reported and so on? So, the, the, you know, those are specific accounting issues that a lot of people are talking about. Okay. Uh, anyway. You can read the paper. I say it's a highly cited paper. I do recommend it highly, right? But since we're running, we only have ten minutes left. I want to talk about uh, a paper I wrote, right, on this topic, which I think might be uh, well. First, let me talk about this paper. This is not a paper. This is a, it's a presentation. All right, because you know, <laughs> one of the things that some researchers, like you know, like Glenn Gray. I mean, you you meet him at some point, right? He thinks that researchers should play the role of devil's advocate, all right? That when everybody's hyping something, researchers should say, hang on, right? You know, <laughs> not to say no, but to say, let's take things, you know, let's truly understand what we're doing. So that, that's part of what we wrote this for, right? So, you know, <laughs> this little cartoon, I think, captures it, all right? That you know, there's always some hype about everything, okay? Uh, you know, and, and sometimes people don't even really understand what they're talking about. They just want to be in it, right? They have this fear of missing out. Okay. All right. Again, I mean, you know, there's a role for people to hype something up because they are the ones who bring about innovation, right? And there's and then there's people who say, okay, but let's make sure we understand the foundations of it, right? That, that's how research uh, progresses. Okay. So <clears throat> going back to Nick Zabo, all right, uh, you know, he talked about... Uh, there's something called the God Protocol, all right? That God will be the third party that doing business internet requires a leap. You know, his point was that all transactions require some leap of faith, <coughs> all right? And, you know, the blockchain, you know, requires trust. I mean, you know, this is a point Glenn makes. You know, you, we, it's easy to say Bitcoin and blockchain is for a trustless world. That's not actually quite true. <coughs> For example, we trust that the world will always have electricity. Because if you don't have electricity, right, this whole world of Bitcoin will just disappear in a, in a flash, right? It's entirely digital. So we need electricity and the internet for it to even exist. By contrast, if you believe in gold, well, the world will come to an end and you'll still have the gold with you, all right? So, yeah, you do still need trust in some things, even in a blockchain world, Okay. But people, you know, people got really excited by this a few years ago, right? This Tapscott, who's a well-known futurist, said it's going to change the world, all right? The accounting people said the same thing. But on the other hand, there are problems with blockchain and Bitcoin, right? Okay, <laughs> Just recently, I was reading about some fellow, and you, you hear these stories all the time, right? Somebody loses their private key. I mean, after all, they can't remember it. This is like... 200, you know, 150 letters long or something like that. They lose their private key and suddenly there are millions of blockchains uh, or bitcoins they can't get access to. All right. So there is some fellow in England. He put his private key in a computer database, uh, in a, you know, in a, <laughs> yeah, a hard drive and then he threw the hard drive out. Right. And it's in some garbage uh, dump in England. Right. And this fellow thinks he, his bitcoins on it are worth. You know, he, he's not even sure that he could get access to it, but he thinks it's worth about two hundred million dollars. And he offered the city, uh, the city council, <laughs> a really? quarter of the amount if they would dig it up for him. Right? This I'll give you a quarter of it. Right? And right? <laughs> you know, so That's you hear funny. these sad stories like that, right? You know, people. So you know, the, the, it's not foolproof. If you lose your private key. You know, that's the end of it. You, it's not like you can go to the bank, show them your passport and write your signature and say, yeah, this is, this I'm Joe Blow, right? Once you lost that private key, you're done for. And there's been many famous instances where people have lost it for one reason or another and the money is gone forever. Okay. Another point that Glenn made is, you know, let's say you're entering data into this data, into this general ledger, uh, into this distributed ledger, and you make a mistake, right? Instead of writing Miklos Vasaheli, with a V, you put Miklos Vasaheli with a W instead. You call right? it Miklos Alice. Yes, whatever. Right? I mean, the point is, that's immutable. For the rest of time, that is going to be there. Okay? 
and you can't change it. I mean, obviously, the whole point of blockchain is you cannot change what's into it. I mean, you can add a correction, I suppose, but you can't go back and fix that. And so that is something you should think about because accountants are used to correcting errors. So under blockchain, you cannot correct it. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> okay. Plus, it turns out there is no one definition of blockchain. No one has even actually come up with a definition. Now, people like the uh, standard setters, you know, the people who come up with, uh, uh, what is that? That I ISO, right? They, are tr they have a project to create a definition. These things will happen. But right now, there is no definition. And I think the best definition is this. A loose umbrella term used by various parties to refer to systems that bear varying levels of resemblance to Bitcoin and its ledger. And I think that's really the best definition, right? People are using the underlying concept of Bitcoin. They're modifying it to come up with something they call blockchain, right? And, and it, some are very close to it, like Ethereum. Some are quite different from it, like permission blockchains, right? So that, we are still in that world, <clears throat> all right? Uh, you know, and so on. Okay, uh, this is part about transaction cost and so on. Okay, uh, right. okay. Let me just <clears throat> go to this one last presentation and then we'll stop. Right, this is a paper we wrote, uh, Glenn and I, and it's called the first mile problem. Right, and th and this is our take upon blockchain, and this is published in. Uh, IJS, I think, uh, in somewhere, right? Okay, but what we were trying to do was try and understand what is the role of auditing uh, in blockchain, okay? And so we came up with from a from this idea, <clears throat> what's called the first mile problem, right? In back, you know, back before you were born, right? There was this problem called the last mile problem, and it was that when you were putting fiber optic cable to to carry uh, data instead of copper wire. Right, you still had this problem that the wires leading from the street to the house were copper based. All right, and that's a lot more expensive. There are lots of houses. It's a lot more expensive to take that last bit, right, from a fiber optic into the house. In fact, there are still lots of places in America where there are no fiber optic cable. Like my my brother lives in Silicon Valley itself, but they do not have fiber optic cable to houses there. Right, for whatever reason, they just don't have it. Okay, so they're still using, uh, what do you call it, ID, what is it? IDS or something, right? Uh, Miklos, what, what was it before fiber optic? Uh, I, IDS or DSL, DSL, right? They still have DSL, which is obsolete uh, technology, okay? <clears throat> right, and, and so what we were addressing was an interesting issue, right? There was a lot of interest in using blockchain for things like supply chain, all right? That is fundamentally different from Bitcoin because Bitcoin, as that video pointed out, is an entirely digital product, all right? The ledger is the currency, right? Without the ledger, without the blockchain, without the digital database, there is no Bitcoin. By contrast, what people like Walmart were trying to do was, was create this digital twin, right? This mirror world, as Miklos calls it, where what's on the blockchain matches a physical reality, okay? <clears throat> and, and what we pointed out is that these are two fundamentally different applications, where it's pure digital versus a physical world, okay? <clears throat> All right? And we are not the first people to point, to point this out, right? We're just sh showing the uh, example of it, okay? And we have this case study of drugs, right? There was this very good book that was published uh, a few years ago, right, called this one, right, Bottle of Lies, right? And if you are taking medicine, I recommend you don't read this book because what this book shows is that most, is that a lot of the drugs sold in America and, and almost all the drugs sold in places like Africa are in fact fake, right? They're not real. They're deliberately diluted to not be effective, right? It's a horrendous story, all right? And <clears throat> what they point out is that the FDA have inspectors who go to like India, let's say, or China, where most of the drugs are being produced, right? And there is enormous fraud there, all right? Okay, when they find out the inspector is coming, overnight, they can put up a fake factory that looks like the real thing, 
to fool them into thinking that everything is being done properly. Okay, when in fact uh, they are being produced horrendously. Okay, <clears throat> all right. And so right now, right, the FDA is creating a blockchain-based method of tagging all drugs in America. All right, so. On this blockchain, this thing called Medi Ledger, you'll be able to see where all the drugs came from. All right, you'll be able to see if you buy it from Walgreen, where did Walgreen buy it from, where was it shipped, who shipped it, you know, all the way back to the manufacturer. Okay. However, consider this problem, right? You may be able to track the drugs all the way back to a manufacturer in India, but if that manufacturer is making that pill out of sawdust, rather than active ingredients, what does it matter that it's on the ledger, right? Yeah, you can track it all the way back to the factory, but the fact of the matter is the drug is useless, okay? And many of the drugs we are getting are, in fact, useless, okay? So he came up with, uh, let's see if I have a quote here, right? I don't think I have quotes here, but I mean, they have horrible examples, like, like you know, he goes there in secret, and he finds drugs being made next to open toilets and dead pigeons in the assembly line and all kinds of horrible, <laughs> horrible stuff, right? I mean, what he says is that the inspectors, these federal, these FDA inspectors, they say, right, that, where is it? They will pay anything to avoid taking a drug made overseas. They've seen how those drugs are produced and they live in fear of them, all right? So <laughs> that's a pretty horrible story, right? So what that is what we call the first mile problem. How do we make sure, right, that the drugs being tracked on the blockchain are the correct drugs, right? I mean, just because it's, a, it's on the blockchain doesn't mean it's not a bad drug, okay? And in fact, uh, a P member of the PCAB board member spoke at a conference at Rutgers a few years ago and made a comment that is now widely cited, right? She said, events recorded in the chain are not necessarily accurate and complete, right? It does not alle alleviate the risk that the transaction is unauthorized, fraudulent, or illegal. It does not address threats that the parties to a transaction are related or that side agreements exist that are not, re not reflected in the chain, all right? In other words, garbage in, garbage out, all right? Just because something's on the block chain doesn't mean that it matches the underlying physical reality. Okay, <clears throat> all right. And so that's why it matters whether the underlying reality is native digital or not. Because if it's native digital like Bitcoin, right, what is on the ledger is the reality. It's the only thing that matters, right? But if you're talking about physical transactions, they have a reality outside the database. And so it is essential that there is a correspondence, an isomorphic correspondence between what's put into the blockchain and the underlying physical reality. Okay. And this is particularly important when you have, uh, sorry, where is this? <clears throat> right? That this is particularly important if what is being recorded is not a physical product at all, but uh, a service component. All right. So let's take, for example, uh, uh, grow, uh, you know, uh, food products. All right. You know, if the food product, if you want to know that what is being sold is not just pork, but organic pork, right? Now you have to know whether during the lifetime of this pig growing to slaughter weight, did the farmer in fact feed them, uh, you know, only organic food? Did they make sure that they were not given organic drugs? That's a much harder thing to verify, right? Because unless you're watching the farmer for 24 months, right? You know, how do you know what kind of food they gave the pig? All right. That's what I mean by saying that if it is a, the organic part is a service component of the pig, and that's very, very difficult to verify. All right. So if you have a native digital blockchain, the digital reality and the representation of that reality on the blockchain is identical by design. The two are identical. There is no physical reality. It's only what is on the blockchain that matters. But by contrast, when we are looking at a physical reality, right, that's when we have this first mile problem. How do we know that what is represented on the blockchain corresponds to the underlying physical reality? Okay. And we give this example. <clears throat> so right? I have a question here. Sure. Yeah. So 
um, if it's something that's represented by physical reality, and then all parties that are part of that physical reality um, have access to that information, in a sense, doesn't that act as a little bit of a confirmation because they see that their their part is matching there? At well, again, least- <laughs> again, again, but just think about the organic pig, right? Okay, yeah. right? Yeah, you can say that there's a pig on the blockchain, right? But the only way to know... but Typically, you just have to take the farmer's word for it that the pig was raised organically, right? Unless you have videotaped every aspect of this pig's life for 24 months. And, and done a chemi- all the food that he Exactly. Ate. Done a chemical analysis of the food. Yeah. You know, all that. You can't. You don't have that physical reality for everyone to agree on, right? That, that's the point uh, that we are making here. Okay, right? I, I, yeah. I get it. Thank yeah, you. so sometimes you can do it, sometimes you can't. Okay. We'll give an example here. All right. So Everledger is a company that was created to ensure that blood diamonds don't enter the supply chain. Okay. So what they do is they make a, a digital copy of the diamond. How do they do that? Right. It's not just by etching it because it costs about $12 to etch a diamond. And so, I mean, anyone can do that. Right. But what they do is they make a physical record of the diamond. They have called it a digital twin. That's where I got the name from. They say they call it a digital twin. I mean, what it looks like, it looks like something like this. So here is a document of a particular diamond. You can see they give you detailed analysis of all the angles on the diamond. But more than that, they actually have, if you go on their website, videotape of this diamond being cut, right? Of this particular diamond being uh, polished and so on. So they're trying to, you know, they give you three, 360 degree, highly detailed HD pictures of this particular diamond and so on to make sure that, that you can actually get a cop, that you can look at the diamond, look at the records and say it's the same thing, right? However, what they cannot tell you, of course, is how do they know the diamond didn't come from the Congo rather than South Africa? In other words, that it's a blood diamond, right? That part is still based on trust, right? They say this diamond came from South Africa. Who knows, right? Because unless we have videotape of somebody digging up the diamond in South Africa, that part of the chain is missing. Okay. Here's another example. All right. I mean, <clears throat> uh, okay. I mean, here's Walmart, right? Here's what they do, right? You know, when they track pork, right, they have this internet of things. Mick plus you'll find this interesting, right? So it's not just that they barcode the pork, right? They have RFID. They have cameras, right, at the warehouse or the slaughterhouse, right? They have records of the trucks moving it, right, to make sure that the temperature is kept, that the temperature never rose, the air conditioning didn't break down and so on, all right? So they have to have all these elaborate measures, right, to ensure, right, that the pork is what it says it is. So, so I mean, that's where the real value added is, right? It's not in the blockchain. It's in this enormous infrastructure to ensure that the digital twin matches the physical product. All right. Let me just give you another uh, final example. All right. Which is in artwork. So there's this thing called the blockchain art collective. All right. And what they do is they, they try to establish provenance, right? So if it's a new piece of art, you can buy, you can go online. You can actually buy these, uh, these stickers, right? And these stickers are designed to be damaged if you try to pull it off. Okay. So that's how they match it onto uh, the product, all right? But if you look at Everledger, they said, look, we tried to move from diamonds to fine wine and art. But the problem we had is like, how do you record on a bottle of wine that it corresponds to our digital twin? You can't etch on it, right? I mean, without damaging the bottle, all right? You can't damage the artwork. So these people came up with this sticker instead, right? Of course, stickers can be counterfeited, all right? And uh, what they do is they have this elaborate system of data to make sure that this is the correct piece of art, right? Because it turns out something like, you know, so they have this tamper-proof thing that matches the art. It goes onto the blockchain, right? And why that's important is because something like 50% of all art that's being sold right now is counterfeit, all right? And that's true even with living artists. Right? In other words, even if the artist is alive, people are still selling fake versions of it. In fact, in one case, they took a piece of art that was fake to the artist and asked the artist, did you paint this? And he said, 
you know, I think I did. <laughs> In fact, it was fake. He just couldn't remember. Right, because he had produced so much art. Right, so blockchain is trying to solve this problem, but we still have this issue. Look at this. You know, when they come with living artists, right, they work directly with them. So the living artists put the sticker, they take the photograph, they take a photograph, presumably of the man next to the photograph painting, and so on to authenticate it. Right, but when it comes, the vast majority of art is not new; it's existing, and then. They run into real problems. Now we have the same problem we discussed earlier. They need to get experts to look at the art, to try and verify, try and find provenance, and so on. Now they can put all that on the blockchain, right? But all if there's the value added now, which is doing that provenance in the first place, right? So that's what we call the first mile problem, right? And of course, we think auditors have a role in overcoming it because we are experts at verifying things. Maybe we can. Uh, you know, maybe we can be playing the role of ensuring that the digital twin on the blockchain matches that physical reality. All right. Anyway, all right. That's just one example of a paper that we wrote on this topic. There's thousands of other topics there in blockchain. So you know, I, I hope you found this a useful exercise to just sort of give a, a sort of basic overview of it. All right. For those who are really interested, you will obviously want to understand the underlying technology. Uh, better, I mean, better than me, right? <laughs> to really know what's involved there, and we have PhD students who created blockchains and done stuff like that, right? So uh, one of our students who graduated, Eid, uh, created a governmental accounting uh, blockchain, and he hopes to apply it when he goes back to Saudi Arabia and so on. Actually, All right? Michael, J June uh, used the uh, hyperledger, uh, Andrea uh, did a blockchain. So we had several of them using blockchain, and we have a project right now. If anyone is interested, they can get involved with the state of Santa Catarina in Brazil, uh, building a, a blockchain for procurement. Yeah. Now, if you are interested in doing more research on blockchain, right? There's a paper in Jetta that Miklos uh, accepted, which I strongly recommend. Let me just bring it up, just and then I'll stop. I know we are gone over time. All right. Uh, so just give me a moment. Uh, can't find it. I'm looking for the paper by uh, Ephraim, not Ephraim, uh, Theo. Last. Oh, sorry. Okay, I know where it is. Hold on. Now I remember where this paper is. It's here. All right. So here's this paper in Jetta. All right. And it's by a, a professor at uh, University of Waterloo. Okay, this one. All right. So let me just go back to the paper in Jetta. I think this is the one in Jetta. Let's see. Yeah. Right. So this is Jetta from last year, fall of 220. Right, and it's called teaching blockchain to accountants. It doesn't be accountants; it can be anyone, right? And this is just a teaching note, right? But uh, there's a link in there to this paper here, which is like a hundred-page document called Introduction to Blockchain. I, I refereed this paper. This is an absolute goldmine. I mean, he's giving it to free. You know, you would pay a hundred dollars for this as a book, right? And what he does is he goes step by step through all of blockchain. All right. And explains all those things that are in there, and then it gives you examples, and it gives you uh, problems, and all kinds of stuff, right? So this is a one-stop, uh, hundred-page book on blockchain, and to teach it to yourself. So this, and then it gives examples. And all right, this, this is an amazing resource that he did for free, right? So I, I strongly recommend that if you have any interest in blockchain, right, that you download this book. It's free. <laughs> right, like I said, it's it, the link is in the in in the Jetta paper here, right? So somewhere here, here you can see. Just look in the referees sections. I mean, you don't need to read the book. This is just giving you a background or, or a summary of the paper. That's what appears, right? But here in uh, Stratopoulos, right? Here, introduction. So you just click on this link. Okay, I can give it to you now. No, I can't. I can't give you the link. 
right. And I'll send it to you now. So, here. Okay. Okay. So this is this link to this this book. All right. And this will teach you all you need to know about uh, blockchain. Okay. So again, if you're interested in doing further research, this is a textbook for you. Okay. Any any questions or anything? Any, any other comments? Michael, did you put the the link in the chat? Yeah, it's in chat, right? But again, you can just get it from the Jetta website too. Well, but okay? that's more work. Yeah. In fact, let me just send you the file. I think I can send the file. Here we go. Yeah, send the file to me too. This is all right. You know, um, June. There you go. So you June should have it. Got, uh, five session undergraduate course on blockchain for us last semester. And uh, there are videos of her course uh, in the digital library. So if you're interested, that's another source. Yeah. Or you no, can uh, talk to Jumi herself. Well, as a matter of fact, I mean, Theo is, has performed such a service that not only does he have this book, right? He actually has videos of him going through the book, right? So, I mean, there's a course there, right, for you, right? I mean, incredible that he did this all for free, right? But anyway, so you can go and look up the videos and he will guide you through his book, all right? Chapter by chapter, telling you what to look for and so on. So, I mean, yeah, this is an amazing resource for you, right? But anyway, I'm going to stop there. We are way past time. I hope you found that a helpful uh, session, all right? And uh, I wish you luck in the rest of the classes. Thank you, Professor Michael. <laughs> no worries. Thank you, Professor Michael. Thank I uploaded... I uploaded you, the paper you cover uh, in the Canvas, so student, uh, okay. if you want to read, uh, you can find the paper in the Canvas. Yeah, and also I recommend you read the Diane Vasaheli paper, right? Because yeah, it's yeah. High, highly cited, right? I also put it on the Canvas. You can even look at my paper if you're interested. <laughs> not yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> obviously. Yeah, uh, I post your paper and... Jundai's paper, Jundai and Professor Michael's paper. Okay, guys. <laughs> if anybody has any questions, feel free to ask me. I, or you know, email me. I'm happy to talk to you all. And I hope one day I'll have a chance to see you all in person.